Gary Brown was nearly ripped apart during a deadly chimp attack on a sightseeing trip in West Africa. He turned and started screaming and charged. I didn't know that they get the, up to the strength of seven men. On the west coast of Africa, deep in the Sierra Leone rainforest, a large captive colony of chimpanzees lives peacefully on the 100-acre Takugama Chimpanzee Sanctuary. Bruno, a 200-pound alpha male, is the colony's leader. An alpha male is the, the term used to describe the highest ranking male chimpanzee. <laughs> The alpha male is the chimpanzee who can win a fight with the other males. In the wild, Bruno would rule a territory at least 50 times the size of the Takugama sanctuary. Less than 40 minutes away, Texan telecommunications engineer Gary Brown is enjoying a day off at his hotel. Working here is a dream come true. They're hiring in Africa. Anybody want to go to Africa? And I held my hand up and said, I'll do it. I wanted to work overseas. Yeah, let's do it. This weekend, Gary's decided to head up to the mountains with a colleague, along with his friend Melvin Mama and their driver, Isa. I said, my days off is going to be spent going and seeing Africa, the real Africa. Isa drives them deep in the rainforest towards the Takugama Chimp Sanctuary. <laughs> he had told me for two weeks before about this place, and, and other Americans had said, yeah, you got to go up there and get pictures of something to see. It's the largest chimp refuge in the world. Bruno is the alpha male. He's so big. Yes, yeah, so I'm from Texas. We grow prairie dogs bigger than any eight. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be glad he's behind an electric fence. Yeah. At the Takugama Sanctuary, Bruno keeps a close eye on his keepers. If you're in captivity, you spend a lot of time just watching. And they would see these locks being opened and uh, closed many times a day and be watching very carefully to see how to get out. <laughs> the chimpanzees presumably took a rock and banged it against the lock. The chimps in this part of the world know how to use rocks. Very few other animals do that. Uh, chimpanzees and humans are really the tool-making and tool-using masters. No one knows for sure how it happened, but it's a breakout. Bruno and 30 other chimps escaped their enclosure and head for the sanctuary's perimeter fence and the jungle beyond. This is really the first taste of freedom that this chimpanzee has had. Unaware of the breakout, Gary and his friends continue to the chimp sanctuary. look up in the mountains and you just mesmerize the trees, the size of the trees, the canopy. Bruno rips through the dense jungle. This is his territory now. He was exploring his world, seeing what world outside the sanctuary was like. 
and is probably afraid. Like the other chimps at the sanctuary, Bruno was brought here as an orphan. His mother was killed in the controversial bushmeat trade. In Sierra Leone, like much of the rest of Africa, people eat chimpanzees and other primates for food. They would have seen their mother and probably other members of their community shot and killed when they were young. The chimpanzees would have that experience. They would remember strangers coming. Uh, they would remember the gunfire. And it's probably a, a reasonable assumption on the chimpanzee's part that a strange human being is a dangerous creature. Bruno hears an approaching car. The chimp immediately sizes up the situation. All of a sudden, out of the brush, this big black thing jumped out. First thing I thought was, cool, you know, I'm seeing something in the wild. Windows. Turn the windows up. Slow down, man. Slow down. Jesus. Issa quickly recognizes that the huge chimp is charging. It's time to get out. Issa. He just threw the car in reverse and just took off backwards. But fleeing only makes things worse. He tied up and he was level with the front window. Bruno seems to have disappeared. And all of a sudden, it was just like an explosion. A chimpanzee that's 120 pounds is gonna be mostly bone and muscle with not a lot of fat. So you have a very compact and powerful creature. Fighting for their lives, they somehow managed to shove the furious chimp out the window. Melvin's hand has been bitten to shreds. Right here, all this was gone. If you run, you're showing that you're afraid of him, you're weak, and he'll take advantage of that. Basically, what they're doing is they're doing damage to whatever they can get a hold of and whatever is exposed to them. Not only is Melvin losing a lot of blood, but bacteria from Bruno's saliva could be spreading through his bloodstream. With two-inch fangs and jaw muscles three times denser than in humans, a chimp's bite can be deadly. They need to get to a hospital fast. And we were yelling at him, slow down, he said, find a place to turn around, turn around, we gotta get out of here. Panicking, he misses a vital turnoff. They're lost. Terrified, they hit a dead end. There was a gate that stood probably 10 to 12 feet tall. <laughs> With their savage attacker hot on their trail. I couldn't believe what was happening to us. They only have one option. We stopped. The collision kills the engine. This car isn't going anywhere. But Bruno hasn't finished protecting his new territory. 
when they tried to escape, that showed the chimpanzee that they were afraid and vulnerable and may well have triggered a chase response. There it is. It's coming back. In the Sierra Leone rainforest, American Gary Brown and his party have been attacked by an enormous chimp. I was blacked out, knocked out. I don't know whatever, but I lost a little bit of time. I don't remember people getting out of the car. Horrified, he spots Melvin on the ground. Bruno is chewing him apart. The chimp takes Melvin's foot in his mouth and bites down. Gary's adrenaline kicks in. I was angry. Angry and just mad. Instead of running, I just started looking for a weapon. That's when I lost it. I had enough. And everything that came over me, came through me, all of a sudden I had total clarity. When the chimpanzee saw Gary standing his ground, we would have seen an opponent who was not afraid, an opponent who was angry, and an opponent who could really inflict some damage of his own. I had the tree turned up and was ramming him. And he was trying to get up, and I kept ramming him on the ground. It was a very powerful and hurtful blow. And uh, that was absolutely the right thing to do, because it convinced the chimp that if it kept up this attack, it was going to get hurt. Suddenly, Bruno bolts off. The fight was over with him, because he kept his back to me. And what I seen when I ta we attacked each other, eye contact, facial expressions, I was totally gone on him now. Melvin is badly wounded. His foot is completely mangled. He's bleeding to death. And he goes, I'm going to die here. And I told him, I said, no, when you die here, I die here with you. I'm not leaving you. He's my friend, you know. And there's no sign anywhere of their driver. Where's this one? He went to help. We gotta go. We gotta go. I could hear chimpanzees everywhere. We were totally surrounded. We took off, off down the mountain. These chimps never jumped out. They stayed in the jungle. I kept looking ahead. Finally, we made it out. We made it to the road, the main road. More than an hour later, a passing truck picks them up and takes them to a nearby hospital. Later that day, Gary learns that Issa was mauled to death by the other runaway chimps. Doctors are unable to save Melvin's foot and three of his fingers. There ain't five minutes, don't go by, I don't see it. I'm gonna have to picture it in my head every day the rest of my life. If you get bit by a snake or a shark or something, it's, it's kind of impersonal and you sort of expect it. But for a chimpanzee, something that is clearly very similar to us in lots of ways, it, it would just seem a lot more personal, I'm sure. I have no misconceptions. I know Bruno could have taken me apart in a heartbeat. He could have taken me, I think, I, he was just off guard. Of the 31 chimpanzees that escaped the sanctuary, 27 were recaptured or returned on their own. Four, including Bruno, 
are still on the loose. Gary Brown's case is not unique. In May 2007, a silverback male gorilla named Boquito escaped from a Rotterdam zoo. Petronella Yvonne the Horde was a regular visitor. She adored Boquito. She visited him four times a week, always smiling and making eye contact. She felt she had a special bond with the 400-pound gorilla. But on May 18, 2007, Boquito somehow escaped. He headed straight for Petronella. To a gorilla, a toothy smile is an act of aggression. And now, it was payback. Boquito dragged her around the zoo, breaking her arm and wrist. Visitors locked themselves in the cafeteria for safety. Boquito broke down the door, sending tables and chairs flying. Eventually, he was shot with a tranquilizer dart. Petronella never fully healed. Apes are by no means the most dangerous animals in captivity. Some would argue that honor belongs to the tiger. It can slay any human in its path with a single bite. Despite their deadly reputation, people still try to contain and control these remarkable creatures. In the 1920s, when touring circuses and wild animal acts were all the rage, Mabel Stark was the Tiger Queen. She would take 18 tigers at a time into the ring, but not even the Tiger Queen could conquer the basic instincts of a hardwired killer. She was attacked 18 times. The worst took place in 1928 at a show in Bangor, Maine. Stalking her from behind, one of her beloved cats lashed out at her left leg, almost severing it above the knee. Smelling blood, a second tiger jumped off his pedestal and pushed Mabel to the ground, mauling her savagely. Although doctors felt she would never survive, Mabel miraculously recovered and was eventually back in the ring with the animals she loved. As Mabel knew all too well, containing tigers is a risky business. Animal lover Jan Gold was also savaged by a captive tiger. When it broke free at a zoo, her lavish fundraising dinner turned into a living nightmare. He just reached up and grabbed my back. He bit into my head, and the next thought was, am I going to survive this? Zoo Boise is one of the most popular attractions in southern Idaho. The stars here are brothers Taiga and Tundra, a newly arrived pair of two-year-old, 600-pound Siberian tigers. Also known as Amor Tigers, they are at the zoo to provide an important gene pool to help ensure the survival of the species. Tigers are highly endangered. There are now more of them living in captivity than in the wild. But keeping one of the world's most deadly hunters behind bars comes with big risks. There have been at least 45 deaths by tigers in captivity of humans over the last 10 years and there have been 115 injuries serious enough to make the media. Tonight, Jan is helping to stage a fundraiser called the Feast for the Beast, a name that will soon prove darkly ironic. This was the largest fundraiser at the zoo. So there was gonna be a silent auction, a live auction, some entertainment. All of this was uh, on the park grounds at the zoo. The money will help build better facilities for the zoo's animals. I believe in doing what I can for the animals. I love animals, it's always been a fascination for me. 
In the wild, taiga and tundra would roam a territory 18 times the size of Manhattan. They are natural-born killers who can never be completely tamed. They can slaughter with a single bite. You can see animals at zoos, for example, that look at children running back and forth in front of the cages. There is an interest in chasing these children. Nearby in the tiger enclosure, taiga and tundra are getting increasingly hungry. In the wild, they would learn to kill and eat large prey, even bears. But on the menu tonight is 10 pounds of raw horse meat and vitamins. While the tiger's meal is being prepared, Jan takes care of last minute details. I had to run some errands and pick some items up for the auction that was gonna take place that evening. And it was just kind of setting things up. Around the zoo, workers are finishing off their chores. One of the tiger cages is accidentally left unlocked, but no one notices. Hello, everyone. Allison, it's wonderful to see you. Are you enjoying yourself? Excellent. Well, the barbecue should almost be ready, and then it'll be over for you. Excellent. Nightfall in the zoo's social event of the year is underway. It's a good turnout. Dinner was kind of buffet style, and then sitting under a tent, and uh, there was a little bit of entertainment, and then we went on to the live auction. In the nearby tiger cage, taiga and tundra are most likely agitated by all the commotion. Unlike the tigers, Jan and the others at the party have already been well fed. And now, it's time to stretch their legs. I got up with some friends and we just decided to walk around. And we saw the manager walk by. Hello, ladies. Hey, how are you doing? You want to feed the boys? Yeah, that'd be great. Well, that meant he was feeding the tigers. <laughs> that's be great. I'm just gonna fall ahead. You guys keep going. Yes, yeah, Steve? We weren't the only ones invited. There were other people, too. Mostly board members or and family of the board members or friends. Jan and her guests are excited. They can't wait to see the big cats feed. Here we go. As I walked down the hall, there was three cages on my right. Jan spots something strange. The last cage, the gate was wide open, and we noticed that. And we just kind of, well, obviously, they must know it's open. And we talked about it, thinking, well, maybe they are going to direct the tigers into the first two cages. <laughs> Instead, one of the tigers is now heading towards the third open cage. And face to face with Jan. All of a sudden, there was a tiger in there. Hello, ladies. How are you doing? You want to feed the boys? At a zoo fundraiser in Boise, Idaho, a cage door has accidentally been left open. And now, board member Jan Gold is face to face with Taiga, a 600 pound Siberian tiger on the loose. It probably never had the door open before. It didn't know what to expect, but it moved forward and it could keep moving forward. <laughs> He is 600 pounds. I mean, his head was 
you know, into my hip area. That's how tall he was. The tiger was probably as surprised as Jan Gould was that they were face to face. And it didn't know what to do, but it did know there was an animal in front of it. At that point, my focus was seeing if I could get this gate shut and keep the tiger in there. But that's easier said than done. Tiger's still not sure how to react. He may not have even seen her as prey because he had never had any experience with live prey. She was just a moving object. But something deep inside said, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. He's moving toward me. I mean, that's a force moving toward me. It was like a few conscious, slow steps, because he wasn't stopping, and it was, he was right there. Desperate, Jan tries to buy herself some time. I held my purse in front of him, trying to get him distracted. The only thing you can do in that situation is try to distract the tiger. And those who survive often survive because the tiger is distracted. People throw stones or sticks. And that's when I realized the people were leaving. I saw a couple people with terrified looks on their faces because he wasn't stopping. The tiger hasn't attacked yet, most likely because Jan's looking it in the eyes. You want to look big. You want to face it. In the wild, tigers prefer to attack their prey from behind. Without realizing, Jan makes a tragic mistake. I was down, and it was very surreal. When she turned around, she provided the framework for the tiger to see, aha, this is prey. And it was at that point that 10 million years of evolution kicked in, and it tried to be a tiger. I mean, he just reached up and grabbed my back and just brought me down. When the tiger is attacking a wild animal, it will grab it by the neck and try and drag it down and break the animal's neck and crush the trachea until it can't breathe anymore. And then it often drags it off to feed. I can feel his chest over my back. He bit into my head. And the next thought was, am I going to survive this? His powerful four-inch canines can easily puncture Jan's neck vertebrae, forcing them apart, eventually breaking her spinal cord. He had no experience. He didn't know where to bite, but he bit, and he grabbed her head, and he kept on going. All the others can do is look on in horror. I thought he actually bit through and crushed my skull, and it was so loud. And, and then he came to a point and just stopped, and he held me there. He just sort of held me. A police officer hired as security for the event takes aim. You guys, shoot the tiger! Shoot the tiger! Get off the hey, for the veteran cop, it's tricky getting a clean shot. He fires slightly over Tiger's head just to scare him off. Startled, Tiger retreats to his cage and is finally locked up. The bullets was enough to surprise the tiger to move back. It had never experienced something like this. Unfortunately, in the shootout, a bullet has accidentally struck Jan in the hip shattering the top of her femur. I'm laying on the ground, and I can't, I can't move from the waist down, or I, I can't feel anything. Jan is rushed to the hospital. Her injuries are horrific. They didn't know if I'd walk again. Um, I had so many nerves that were damaged, because uh, that bullet, when it hit my bone, it exploded. And so there, I still have lots of shrapnel in there. My hip had to be rebuilt, and a lot of nerves were severed. I've lost probably about a third of the nerve and muscle activity in my leg. 
It takes more than two years for Jan to get over the ordeal, and there aren't just the physical scars to deal with. There was a period of time where uh, every time I closed my eyes, it would be, I'd be reliving it under a different scenario. That was one of the things I had to go through and recover from. The reason Jan Gold is alive today is the tiger was too young, too inexperienced, didn't know how to deal a fatal blow. But at the end of the day, a tiger is a tiger, and it will not have lost its tigerness. For the last eight years, Taiga and Tundra have continued to live in Zoo Boise with no further incidents. To avoid conflict, most captive animals are kept away from humans. But what about those bred specifically to attack, like bulls? Every 7th of July, locals and tourists gather in Pamplona, Spain to outrun a pack of angry bulls. It's a controversial event that dates back to the 16th century. As many as 300 participants are injured each year. 14 have been killed since 1910. In 1995, Matthew Tassio fell while trying to avoid a charging bull. Just 22, Tassio became the first American to die on the streets of Pamplona. Even matadors with years of training can never completely control a powerful bull. In 1947, top bullfighter Manuel Rodriguez Sanchez finally met his match. Going in for the kill, Sanchez was savagely gored, his femoral artery slashed by the animal's jagged horns. The man everyone thought could tame the brute force of a bull was pronounced dead hours later. Half a century later, police officer Kenneth Shaw also found out the hard way what it's like to try to stop a 1,400-pound runaway bull. And was on top of me, slamming me into the ground, and I felt the pain go up to my chest. This thing ain't stopping. Just north of Boston, in Lowell, Massachusetts, a controversial event is underway, a bloodless bullfight. In this version of the event, the animals are not killed. Nonetheless, bulls that are used are much more aggressive than regular farm animals. They're wiry, they're fit, they're athletic, they're fast, they're angry. So the, if you like, threshold for aggression is very different. So it's comparing a Labrador with a pit bull. As this enormous 1,400-pounder waits to face the matador, he gets increasingly worked up. When they can find, when they're frightened, they get sometimes mean and, and certainly unpredictable. So stress, fear, is really the big danger signal for the bulls that will get them to do things that in nature they would never do normally. And for this bull, that means busting out of his trailer, one way or another. Nearby, Lowell police officers Maggie Malik and Kenneth Shaw are on duty. Basically, your job was to keep the patrons from not coming from the facility with any type of alcohol or anything like that. Gorgeous, hot, bright, sunny day. We had over 300 cars. We almost had to close the gates because we couldn't fit another car in. Maggie's main concern is that she doesn't have to watch any of the fight. I didn't want to say it because I don't agree with an animal to be antagonized and ridiculed, and I felt this was inhumane. <laughs> 
Their real problem, however, is a few hundred yards away in the bull's trailer. The noise is pushing the animal over the edge. There was a lot of alcohol flowing. There was a lot of banging around and noise and music, and uh, that's pretty nasty cocktail for a bull, really. You have the makings of a, a, a bull that is going to be, if you like, out of his mind with anger. Suddenly, panic rips through the crowd milling around outside. All of a sudden, I see people start to run and start screaming. Kenneth races around the corner and comes face to face with a half-ton nightmare. Somehow, the angry bull is broken loose. Now, all of a sudden, I'm in a situation where I have to deal with that animal that's running rampant. There's no truth in the belief that red specifically is antagonistic to bulls. Movement is the biggest single factor which triggers a bull attack. The bull zeroes in on a target. The gentleman was basically with his back up against the bed of the pickup truck and the bull just kept slamming him into the back end of the pickup truck. The strength of this animal was truly amazing. If Kenneth doesn't do something quick, the man will be crushed to a pulp. The diamond-like tip of the bull's horns can easily gore into soft tissues. I just started to basically make noises, waving my hands, try to, you know, trying to get its attention. And then turn its attention on me. My adrenaline was just, you know, it just all came so quickly. Charging at full speed is a wall of muscle. It was a scary sight. Nearby, Maggie is unaware that a furious monster is gunning for her partner. Everybody's screaming, there's music going on. You can't really hear anything. It charged me, and I jumped on a vehicle that was close. It slammed off that, that vehicle, and then just bounced off. But I knew it could uh, pack a wallop, so I didn't want to get hit with that. There is no protection against an attack by a determined bull, especially a bull of that breeding of that degree of infuriation, of that degree of temper. Finally, Maggie spots her partner. Kenneth has nowhere to go. They can really hit like a battering ram. Nothing is going to stop them, really. And you'll be punctured. It'll go through your rib cage or some other part of your anatomy. <laughs> They basically threw my body from the side onto the hood of the vehicle to, uh, to get away from its wrath. And that made the, the bull mad. Don't frustrate him and don't antagonize him because you always know that he can pull all the shots. It's frustrated. It looks for something else to demolish. It spots Maggie. He came with a run. He came with a snort. I don't know how to play like that. It's like, oh my God, what do I do with this bull? She zigzags, desperately trying to lose him, but he sticks to her like a shadow. They have this real benefit of almost 360 degrees uh, coverage, so it makes them able probably to react more quickly than humans. So if you stand still, the likelihood is that you won't be attacked. Golly, locked in on my eyes. And that put a chill down my spine. They do this burst of heavy breath out from the nostrils. And this is carrying a chemical message. I'm loaded with testosterone. I'm the, really the king 
guy around here, and you take me on at your peril. The bull loses interest in Maggie and rushes off the stadium grounds, still fuming. Trying to escape, he heads downtown. Oh my God. If the bull can't be stopped, hundreds of lives are now at risk. At a bloodless bullfight in Lowell, Massachusetts, a half-ton bull is on a violent rampage. And now, it's police officer Kenneth Shaw's job to take it down before he reaches the busiest part of town. I'm thinking that this animal is, is gonna basically cause a lot of havoc if we don't stop it. I didn't really even know what I was gonna do. I didn't want anybody else to get hurt. His strength and his power and, and whatever is going on with him. We're not taught in the police academy how to handle it. The only way that I'm gonna be able to take it out was if I hit it in the head. But the bullets barely make a dent. So the bullets would have hit into the side of that animal, caused it pain, but didn't ultimately penetrate and, and cause damage to internal organs. All they would have succeeded in doing would be to infuriate the animal. They have very good armor in the form of their thick skin. The raging bull continues towards the crowd. And I was just hoping that it wasn't going to take a left where all the shopping malls were. Kenneth catches a break. The bull runs off the road and right into an empty parking lot. In an ideal situation, they would have just tried to contain or keep it in that parking lot, let it calm down. This is Officer Kenneth Shaw. I need backup. I need backup. The animal is cornered. It panics. And then it spots a familiar foe. The bull would have recognized him as that same individual, no doubt, and it was an unfinished battle. It's now or never for Kenneth. I have to try to take this out. If I don't, someone else is going to get hurt. But again, the bullets have little effect. This thing ain't stopping. So then all of a sudden it turned and started to do an all-out charge right at me. They will charge through a, literally a brick wall. It was basically literally trying to destroy me, it was trying to kill me. You know, it was bulldozing me and bulldozing me into the ground. Every time that I tried to get up and get off the ground, it kind of knew what it was doing. It swing its head and swipe at my feet and knock me back on the ground again. Pressure that they're able to exert, they all their weight on your body, um, you're going to have broken bones and a reshaped face. And the intention is to kill you, is to take you out. All of a sudden, I felt the pain go up to my chest. It was on top of me, basically slamming me into the ground with its head with the horn slamming me constantly at the, in my leg area. The incredibly solid neck and shoulder muscles of the bull don't bend or buckle on impact. It hits like a battering ram. Maggie tries to draw the bull away for the second time. Seeing Kenny's shattered uniform, seeing the blood on his skin, I, at that point, was not sure if he had gorged him in a major organ, and that takes you only seconds to bleed out. The bull is momentarily confused by Maggie's shouts, buying Kenneth just enough time to crawl for cover beside a car. His knee is gorged. It looked like prime rib. And I know that a lot of grout and dirt and soot, it needs a lot of cleaning, a lot of room for infection, tendon repair, maybe fractured bones. Kenneth's in bad shape. Time is ticking. Maggie needs to act now. 
But the bull still wants a piece of Maggie and takes dead aim. So I said, come on, let's bring it on. Let's go get him. And I shot him right between the eyeballs and then on the forehead. Which is actually the location that is used in slaughter, official slaughter of cattle. This time, the shot stuns the half-ton bull. He staggers away to the other end of the lot. Meanwhile, it's not looking good for Kenneth. I looked down and I could see my bones running, running the back of my, my leg. You're gonna be fine. You're gonna be fine. The bull is finally put down when police backup arrives at the scene. Kenneth is rushed to the hospital and goes under the knife. I tore out a piece of my, my quadricep. And then I also received basically a laceration to one of my, my testicles. I could bend one knee, but I couldn't bend the other. Two years later, he finally returns to the police force, a hero. I get the Medal of Valor for basically my, my actions that day. Despite the controversy, bloodless bullfights are still held in some states, including Texas and California. Conservationist Gary Kamasha was lucky to escape alive when he was savagely attacked by a lion on a game reserve. And then um, uh, I thought that this was it. I, I thought this, is, this would be the end. The African savanna, home to one of the most feared predators on Earth, the lion. Thousands of people have met their end in the jaws of these killer cats. This pride lives in a game reserve in South Africa's Umpumalanga province. And when food is short or they feel threatened, these big cats can turn man-eating. With lions around, no one can afford to be off guard. Danger is part of the job for 23-year-old conservationist Gary Kamasha. He manages the reserve's lions, and today, he has a problem. A lioness is wounded, and she's pregnant. This female, because she was injured and finding it difficult to keep up with the pride to feed and to, and to compete for food around the carcasses and things like that, she was getting very hungry. If Gary tries to treat the lioness, the pride can tear him apart. His plan, to isolate her in an enclosure by luring her in with bait. But the dominant males get to the meat first. Some are her own offspring. Days later, Gary is still waiting. He relaxes with friends and makes a dangerous mistake. I took off my sidearm and put it to the one side to just be more comfortable uh, and not thinking of anything that can happen at that point. But today will be different. The pride is staying outside the enclosure and the hungry lioness grabs the opportunity to feed. She's, she's 
in the closer. Gary is delighted she's finally taken the bait. I'll be back, I'll be back in a couple of minutes. I just want to close the gate. We will... Now we can okay. treat her injury. Come, let's go. I basically thought, okay, this is what we've been hoping for. Let's quickly go and close the gates and make sure that she's constrained inside. But in the rush, he's forgotten the one thing that could protect him in an attack. <clears throat> 150 feet from the enclosure gates, they see the pride. The lioness isn't with them. Here she is, behind that bush. Oh. Gary is relieved this plan is finally working. But something is wrong. She's not alone. One of the pride's aggressive young males is inside the enclosure and will attack if threatened. This male was always been a bit edgy and agitated, barking at you and uh, coughing, and the typical attack bark if you get too close to him. Getting the young lion out is dangerous, but without treatment, the lioness could die of gangrene. Gary's plan, forcing the young male out by using the truck. So uh, we went into the, the gate, and I tried to get the vehicle between the male and this female, and then push him out so that he could be running out. And once he would be outside, we could close the gates. But the young lion isn't easily intimidated. He's not leaving. Uh, I think what happened at that point, he was looking at the movement of the vehicle. So the vehicle and the people inside was posing a threat to him as well as myself. And instead of him uh, running for the gate, he was just seeing himself being crowded by this whole scenario. I was worried that he might start getting agitated, running up and down, psyching up the female as well, the rest of the pride. Forcing him out with the truck hasn't worked. All Gary can do now is try to flush the lion out himself. Just gonna have to go in there and chase him out. I thought I'd go on foot, use the vehicle as protection so the female couldn't really see what was going on, and then chase him out on foot. It's a risky move especially as Gary still hasn't realized he's forgotten his gun. By trying to flush a young adolescent male on foot is a big mistake. Young males tend to be the biggest Troublemakers, you know, lions are not used to being in close proximity to human beings that are not inside of a vehicle. The lion is starting to feel threatened. It could attack at any moment. I was just assuming that this male would just run out, and I wasn't even thinking of him uh, feeling a bit of uh, discomfort. He's, I was entering his comfort zone and his, his personal space. was essentially cornered because he was in, in a fenced-in area. So that's the time when an, an animal will react out of fear. Hey, hey, hey. Get away, get Instead of diverting his, his, his uh, direction towards the gap between myself and the vehicle, he was actually zooming in on me. I did think of that point my side off. This was the most stupid thing that I could have done. Uh, I don't know why I took it off. 
Gary tries frantically to get out of the lion's way, but it's too late. You was planning to go for my upper body. I moved back, he misjudged himself. I think that actually, to a certain extent, saved my life. The lion has missed Gary's head, but it locks its vice-like jaws around his leg. His friends, also unarmed, can only watch in horror. Gary has now become human prey. A lion has savagely attacked conservationist Gary Kamash. Unarmed, he must now fight for his life with his bare hands. And I had my hands trying to push his head down and away from me and, and keep him down. It was like a iron vice, a big vice just clamping around my leg. A lion's jaws can bite with nearly 900 pounds of pressure, enough to snap the spine of its prey with ease. The lion certainly was trying to control him and immobilize him and get him, get him to a point where he could access a more vital area. Outside the enclosure, the pride can smell blood. The pride with trying to figure out what's busy happening, what, where did the, the sounds come from. The pride is becoming restless. If they join in the attack, Gary is finished. Frantic, he tries to pry open the lion's jaws. Well, I tried to put my thumbs into his mouth between his uh, premolars. I couldn't get him in. They were already too close to each other. I just realized there's no way I'll be able to get my leg out of this. Gary's friend Johan tries to find anything he can to use as a weapon. But he comes up empty. The pride is getting agitated. They can sense a kill. Some lions are dedicated man-eaters using humans as a regular part of their diet. The hunting instinct kicks in. The attack is on. The rest of the pride was already coming in, and I shouted to my friend, uh, keep the rest of the pride away, keep the rest of the pride away. And, uh, knowing that if they would come in, it would have been the end. Keep the freaking pride away! Uh, I thought that this was it. Uh, with the rest of the pride coming in to assist, I thought this, is, this would be the end. I wouldn't be able to fend off the rest of the group, so I was shouting at him, and he jumped out of the vehicle and started uh, throwing uh, pieces of branches and, and rocks. Incredibly, Johan manages to hold the pride back. But Gary's leg is still locked in the lion's mouth. He needs to do something fast. Desperate, Gary attacks the lion's only weak spot, its eyes. I could just feel when I pressed my thumb into his eye that he was blinking and trying to get out. That was hurting him. The nose and the eyes are very vulnerable the part of them that they have to, at all costs, protect. But the lion won't let go. It fights back with razor-sharp claws. Or not only did they, will they shred your flesh like a hot knife through butter, but uh, the infections caused by those claws are, are also very septic and can lead to 
rapid infection and death. A lion's claws carry deadly bacteria that can cause tumors, inflammation of the heart, and kidney failure. I still remember the sound of ripping flesh. And I could see the skin stretching and then could feel the skin ripping. Time is running out. <laughs> Johan has nothing else to throw at the lions. If the pride attacks, Gary is unlikely to escape alive. South African conservationist Gary Kamasha is being ripped apart by a lion. The rest of the pride are about to join the attack. Gary, I can't keep them back any longer. Fearing for his life, Johan has gotten back in the vehicle. The worst moment for me, Johan shouting, uh, I can't fend him anymore, and his door closing, yeah, his door banging, closing up. I realized how close I was to, um, to death. Gary struggles desperately to free himself. He punches the lion in the eye, but it won't let go. And I was just going down on his eye with my fist as hard as I could, and, and putting my thumb into his eyes and pressing down. For a moment, the lion loosens its grip. Gary sees his chance and takes it. I think what he wanted to do was to reposition himself and take me down. When he started opening his mouth, I ripped my leg out of his mouth. Gary, come! Come! Come on, get him! The rest of the pride was very psyched up. Four, five, ten seconds longer than I would have been taken and ripped apart. Adrenaline is coursing through Gary's body, numbing his pain. Only when he's safely away does he realize the severity of his wounds. When I looked down, I saw the piece of flesh hanging out the back of my leg. He ripped some of my tendons out of my arm as well, and I didn't even pick up that I couldn't use my left hand properly. Let's pull over. I'll drive, OK? OK. Just pull over. Over. It takes half an hour to get to the nearest hospital. On the road um, down to the doctor, I, I remember I started feeling very awkward. I started getting a bit nauseous and, and not feeling well. I was bleeding extensively. Gary gets more than 50 stitches in his leg and arm. He's lucky to be alive. There was a number of things that saved my life that day, and the one thing that was, was definitely was the fact that he was inexperienced and a young uh, lion. And the fact that I, I saw him coming for me and jumped backwards. Just a few weeks later, Gary returns to work on the game reserve. In the meantime, the lioness's wounds has healed naturally, and she's given birth to a healthy litter. Gary's close brush with death has made him realize that on the savanna, you can never drop your guard. I think what it did cause me is to be way more cautious than I was at that point, because I, I can remember I was getting more and more complacent with these animals. Ever since Homo sapiens first walked the African savanna, we have lived in fear of the mighty lion. These superb predators have ruled their territory for over a million years. Unarmed, humans stand little chance. Even today, more than 100 people every year are killed by lions. Humans have always been on the menu of lions throughout history you know, throughout our co-evolution with them. 
But lions are not the only man-eaters here. The hyena is just as deadly. It can eat every part of its victim, even the bones. Hyenas are despised because they dig up graves and eat human remains. And feared because they kill the living. In the 1950s, hyenas terrorized a village in Malawi. They killed and devoured 27 people, many of them children. The stealthy man-eaters crept up on villagers as they slept outdoors during hot weather. They grabbed their victims by the head and dragged them off into the bushes to feed. There was little left for devastated families to bury. Hyenas are fearless predators. In 1972, a Malawi school teacher, Yerendas Luggage, was cycling to work when he was taken down by hyenas. He knew there'd be nothing left of him if they dragged him away. He fought as hard as he could, screaming for help. By the time villagers rescued him, he was barely alive. People forget how deadly hyenas can be. Danny Tell Blanche wasn't scared of them until one tried to eat him alive. And I thought, I'm going to die now. Spring 1998, aircraft pilot Danny Terblanche is enjoying a week's vacation with friends on the Zambezi River. Every year, the group heads off into the wilderness for a taste of adventure. All the time, there's exciting moments uh, because there's a lot of hippo, there's crocodiles, lions, and of course, hyenas. <laughs> After an action-packed day on the water, the friends pull up for the evening. A ground crew has set up camp and cooked a hearty meal. We thought we had a very successful trip, so we were a very happy bunch of people. It's been great, six days. You know, especially when you and it's the last day of the holiday, time to celebrate. Some of my friends were wine farmers, and of course, we brought a lot of good wine with us. We heard lions every night. We knew there was quite a lot of lions, but nobody had a gun. Are you sure you're still going to sleep out here tonight? Yeah, man. Predators are nearby, but Danny won't sleep in a tent. A big mistake. There's a recipe for hyena attacks, and the recipe would be sleeping with your door open, sleeping in your sleeping bag on the ground outside of a tent. Oh, I think you're welcome. Right, so I'm going to call it a night. <laughs> Good night, gentlemen. Yeah, I sleep well. All right. Yeah, you Cheers. too. Cheers. Good night. You. Every night I slept outside, yes. But uh, with some protection, I had chairs around my mattress. And of course, I had a mosquito net that was hanging from a tree. But a flimsy mosquito net won't stop a hungry man eater. These are animals that can dent a pipe, a one-inch pipe. They can crush it without hurting their teeth. At night, 
the hyena has a huge advantage. It can see in the dark. Hyenas, like, like all nocturnal hunters, have incredible uh, ability to see and smell at night. Night vision is excellent. They're looking for garbage. They're looking for the things that were thrown out after dinner. And they come on to something like a person laying there sleeping. That's a carcass to a hyena. You are a large meal for them. They're not going to check your pulse before they go ahead and grab you. Somebody, they hit me with a, with a plank over my, over my head. When Danny realizes it's a hyena attack, his blood runs cold. If it drags him into the bushes, it could tear him apart in seconds. Danny Terreblanche is on a kayaking holiday on the Zambezi River when he is attacked by a hyena. I've got no weapon, and I think my way of protecting myself is to, is to pull a thick blanket over my head. It doesn't bite my head. A hyena's bite can exert a force of up to 1,000 pounds. They have particularly large teeth, premolars to crush bones, and carnations at the back of the mouth, which slice up meat like scissors. They have the strongest bite of any predator on Earth. Stronger than a lion, stronger than a bear. They go through bone like you and I go through a candy bar. I tried to, to lie on my stomach with, in a crawl position, but it was just instinct. Then it grabbed me by the, by the neck and then and dragged me. A few feet further into the bushes, and he could be ripped to pieces by the hungry hyena. He will proceed to drag you off and start eating you. That's what would happen. The hyena strategy is to, to kill you and then dismember you and then run away with whatever bits they could. Without the support of the rest of the pack, the hyena cannot fight for its meal. So it retreats. I, f I felt the pain in my head and when I felt it with my hand, I knew there was something terribly wrong. Yes. I felt a hole in my head. My biggest fear was that I'm, I lost my ear and I'm going to lose my hearing. And of course, the first thing that goes through one's mind is that I'm going to lose my, my flying career. Luckily, Danny's ear is still in one piece. Hold on, we just need to clean the ear. My ear was still in the mosquito net, hanging by a little piece of, 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 of skin from my head. I think they probably will wash it with some good old cape, dry red wine. <laughs> Desperate to save his ear, his friends bind it back onto the gaping wound. The nearest hospital is in Kariba, 80 miles across rough terrain. They need to hurry. Danny is at grave risk of a deadly infection. Hyenas eat rotting carcasses, and their mouths are crawling with dangerous bacteria. You can imagine the bumps in the road. I don't know how many times I've passed out. Adrenaline from the attack is wearing off. Danny's in shock. I prayed a lot, okay. and I asked God to, to, to help me, and uh, 
That was, I think, that maybe pulled me through. All right, now we're going to get to now. Good to see you. Good to see you. It takes them nearly nine hours to reach Kariba. The town only has a small, basic hospital. The doctor does what she can to save Danny's ear. She had to, uh, to stitch it back onto my head, but there was no, no uh, anesthetics. My friends had to hold me on the table while she, she did the job. That was very, very painful. Danny's then flown back to South Africa, where a plastic surgeon performs three painful operations. His ear is finally restored, and he can resume his flying career. As Danny discovered, on the savannah, Homo sapiens can become just another link in the food chain. <laughs> Humans aren't the usual prey for hyenas and lions, but when food is scarce, these animals will attack almost anything. In 1898, when an epidemic meant other prey was in short supply, Two hungry lions launched one of the worst series of attacks ever recorded. The man-eating pair are thought to have killed more than 100 railway workers in Kenya. The lions may have begun by scavenging graves. Then, with a taste for human flesh, they began a bloody rampage that lasted nine months. Work came to a standstill. Night curfews were imposed. Workers hoped high fences and fires would keep them safe. But the lions still got in. They pulled their prey from their beds and dragged them off into the bushes to be devoured. Chief Engineer Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson knew he had to kill the lions if the railway was to be built. He tried for months to catch the savage predators. Then, finally, on the night of December 9th, 1898, he managed to shoot the first lion. 20 days later, he killed the second. Patterson became an instant hero. Male lions are extremely dangerous, but the lioness is just as deadly. She is a true hunter of the pride, a ruthless, efficient killer. When Bruce Meekall had to hunt a rogue lioness, he soon found out why these predators have such a terrifying reputation. She had bitten down from the top of my head, and I was fighting from my mouth. Limpopo, South Africa. This lioness is a loner. She's old and hungry. Local villagers are terrified she might start preying on their cattle or on them. The lions are usually persecuted by people because they pose a threat. Usually that threat is to their livestock, to their goats or their cattle. Professional hunters are called in to put her down. Leading the team is conservationist Bruce Meekall. He's sad to have to kill such a magnificent animal, 
doing the job humanely is his top priority. It's your responsibility to make sure that things are done properly and as ethically as possible. You, got the road? Yeah. you know, make sure that that the animal goes down, you know, in a clean sweep. We had been notified by one of the trackers where the lioness was, so we headed up in our vehicle to that area. There's quite a few things to take into consideration when hunting a lion. Wind direction, the vegetation around you, and obviously the fact that you've got to have a, a you know, clear visual around you. You don't want to be in really dense bush where you can end up in, in a bad situation. Bruce and his crew begin tracking the rogue lioness. So we started walking, looking for signs to see where she was. Tracks, uh, old kills, things like that. But the lioness has probably already picked up the hunter's scent and keeps out of sight. Lions are very good hunters. They're very good at camouflaging themselves. For two days, they search for the big cat, but she remains invisible. The longer it takes to find her, the greater the danger to local villagers. If lions can get away with it, if they have opportunities, they consider humans part of the diet, especially in, in more harsh environments where prey density of their preferred prey is lower. Finally, they work out which way the animal is heading. If they're quick, they just might catch her. Later that morning, we had actually bumped into her, purely through tracking. That enabled us, obviously, to, to get set up uh, to take the shot. Bruce wants to take the lioness out with a single bullet. If he only wounds her, she's likely to attack. Bruce Mikal has been tracking a rogue lioness for two days. He now needs to put her down with a single bullet. The shot was a good shot. But she got up and ran off. Went into thick bush. Something has gone very wrong. The bullet hit the lioness, but hasn't killed her of the bullet hadn't done what it was supposed to do. But it opens up and, and has a hard impact um, in order to make an instant kill. In this situation, it basically just went straight through. If you didn't kill them the first time and you just wounded them and it wasn't in, in, in a vital area and they survived, you would never get a chance again to catch up with them, and, and, and if you did, it would be after they killed another dozen or more people. This is hard for Bruce. What should have been a swift, humane kill has resulted in an angry, injured animal. The animal's adrenaline is up, and by walking in there immediately, you basically putting yourself into a situation where um, she's going to come out and attack you. They decide to give the lioness a chance to calm down. We head back as a safety precaution and got in our vehicles. An hour later, 
Bruce sets off again. He knows that he and his team are now vulnerable. The lioness is on the defensive and could strike at any moment. When a lion is badly injured, they'll retreat two or three times at the most before they'll turn and they'll, and they'll attack, whether you have 100 people with you or whether it's one or two people. The lioness has the hunters in her sights. She waits patiently for them to come closer. Her pursuers are now her prey. cover a distance of 100 meters in about six seconds. So uh, there's not much chance to get into any position. So you basically turn point and take a shot. By the time I reloaded to, to take the second shot, she had jumped onto me. The attack is savage. The lioness goes straight for Bruce's head. The main thing that they go for are the, is the most vital spot and the most vulnerable spot, and that's the neck and the head. As we came down towards the ground, she had already had her mouth over my head and bit me on the back of my head. With the impact of us hitting the ground, my head bounced out of her mouth. To see teeth and saliva and hair and, I mean, the sound that they make is incredibly loud. The others can't fire. They could hit Bruce. They, they fling you around like a ragdoll. With their strength and power, every time they hit you, your whole body has been thrown about. She would have been feeling for his vertebrae so she could puncture the and sever the spinal cord. The wounded cat is in a frenzy. You don't know what's happening. You're just trying to get a grip of the whole situation around you and what to do in order to survive. The lioness is much stronger than Bruce. The moment he weakens, she will kill him. Bruce Mikal has been savagely attacked by a wounded lioness. His team can't shoot her because they might kill him. He's become human prey. Once they go into attack mode, they don't turn back. And then they're going to press that attack until, until either you're dead or they're dead. All you're thinking about is trying to survive, trying to get yourself into a position of maybe having some a, 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 an inch of control. He must try to keep the lioness from moving long enough for his team to shoot her without hitting him. Bruce is an experienced hunter. He knows the lioness will try to gut him with her back claws. My natural instinct was to pick my legs up so she didn't disembowel me. And when she came for my face, that's when I stuck my arm in her mouth. Bruce has disabled two of her deadly weapons, her teeth and back claws. He hugs the lioness tight to immobilize her. The ordeal is finally over. But even though she nearly killed him, Bruce can't help regretting that this superb creature 
had to be put down. In the instance when she had died, there is... <sighs> being so close, there is definitely a, a feeling that goes through you of what's happened to you and what's happened to her. Shock sets in quickly. Bruce needs urgent medical attention. He has torn veins and over 40 lacerations. His injuries are life-threatening. A lion's saliva carries bacteria, which can cause terrible infection and internal bleeding. I spent five and a half hours in surgery. I came out of hospital after one and a half to two weeks. You know, then it's a long recovery, I think, from there, uh, mentally and physically. Within a couple of months, I'd healed up. I was able to use, you know, my arm again and, 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 a, and a bit of therapy that, you know, that helped. On the mental side, I think you've got to accept what's happened to you and move forward. You know, there's very few first-hand accounts like that because lions usually, when they attack like that, they usually kill their victim. Bruce is lucky to survive. Despite his close brush with death, he goes back to work as a conservation manager in a savanna. But he's given up hunting for good. It's hard to, to go back to doing what you were doing after an incident like that. There's definitely a sense of respect and a sense of fear. Lions and hyenas can kill a person in seconds, but attacks are rare. Normally, these predators will avoid us. It's only when food is scarce or they feel threatened that they strike. And when they do, the results are devastating. I realized how close I was to death that day. Um, I think it, it may, gave me a lot of more respect for life. It, it made me realizing that every moment, any mo moment could be your last moment. Surprisingly, many survivors don't blame the animals. I've got uh, uh, more respect for hyenas because it's an open opportunistic killer. I have more respect for, for hyena and I won't take a chance or give them a chance. In the summer of 2005, Johan Otter tried to save his daughter from the jaws of an angry grizzly while hiking in Montana. I really felt like I was trying to rip my head off. And I remember thinking, okay, one more bite and I'm done. Glacier National Park, one of America's last great wilderness areas. It's home to the nation's most feared predator, the grizzly bear. Every year, grizzlies claim the lives of people who get too close. Johan Otter and his daughter Jenna are here for a hiking vacation. This one right here. Right here. Yep. To celebrate her graduation. All right. And it's kind of cool that your daughter still wants to go on a senior trip, you know, and with dad to go into the mountains. But today's ambitious hike will test them in more ways than they can possibly imagine. Survival in this wilderness is brutal. This female grizzly is dangerous. She has two cubs and will attack anything that comes near them. Dr. Barry Gilbert knows just how deadly these bears can be. 
he himself was badly mauled by a grizzly. The grizzly bears have the smallest young of any of the mammals. They can weigh two or three pounds when they're young, so they're really vulnerable. This is what has caused the female to evolve into being suicidally aggressive. She lays out her all for those cubs. It's too early for other hikers to be on the trail. I sort of had this underlying nervousness. In the morning and the evening hours are the prime feeding times for animals, so that's when they're going to be out and about a lot more. Oh, I got to take, take a video of this. This is beautiful. Wow. But Dad, we've got a long way to go. Let's keep going. Uh -huh. But Johan and Jenna are seasoned hikers. The precaution I knew when hiking was just to make noise. We knew to not be too quiet, although we didn't know how loud to actually be. We talked continuously during that time, and we made sure we looked around as much as possible. So your mom wanted me to have a talk with you about keeping to your studies. They also carry a can of bear spray. This is their only defense against a predator attack. I don't. We didn't have it on our belt, it was just in the backpack. You know, really thinking that you're not going to be able to have to use that. It's not going to happen to you. They climb higher and further away from human habitation. If anything should happen to them, Johan and Jenna are on their own. Grizzlies normally steer clear of people. They can pick up a scent from over two miles away. But the wind is blowing down the mountain, away from the bear. And that would just negate the bear's best warning system, which is its nose, its sense of smell. And that's almost a perfect storm scenario. The grizzly is now on a deadly collision course. A surprised bear is an angry bear, and an angry bear is an aggressive bear and a dangerous bear. So do you honestly think that you're going to be able to keep up with, you know, practice and dance? Look at this. High above the lake, the view is spectacular. Johan and Jenna fall silent, a mistake that could cost their lives. There's a bend in the trail, so you can't see around it, but you don't expect anything to be around it, um, which I guess is a, a bad assumption to make. In front of me is a mother grizzly bear, followed by two cubs right behind her. I thought, like, I'm going to die. If you turn and run, you've immediately put a hamburger sign across your back. <laughs> to save his daughter, Johan puts his own life on the line. And it's something instinctual. It's not something you actually think about. <laughs> It basically went into my thigh. The bear bites deep into Johan's leg, again and again, right down to the bone. It wasn't like was holding on to my leg and just kind of being in there. No, it was kind of in out type of thing. If he wants to live, Johan has to break loose. But there's only one way out, down. I decided to jump off the trail. It was about 20, 25 feet into some bushes. Oh. My eye was already bleeding or something like that at that point, so something must have gotten into my face. Because oh. the animal went at me like this, so it must have been one of the claws. Then I 
see the can of bear spray that my dad had in the side pocket of his backpack. I pick up the can, but I didn't know how to work the can. And you can't really stop and read instructions at that point. Out of time and options, Jenna leaps into the unknown. Johan has no idea his daughter has jumped. Jenna, down here! And I see the bear cocks its head back again, looks down at me. By being active, she might have interpreted that he was doing a circle around to get at the cubs. Hell-bent on finishing them off, the bear charges down the mountain. Never felt or seen anything as strong and fast in my life. There's one big piece of muscle. He was lifting me up nearly out of the bushes. Bears will sometimes try to flip people over to get at their face when they're going after people. It was like, I need to keep this animal with me, you know, away from Jenna, basically. Next thing I remember, falling around a good steep fall, I'd say 30 feet or something. Johan's luck holds. He's cheated death once more. But by chance, Johan has landed on the same ledge as Jenna. And then when I landed down, and here's that bear, it's still, you know, with me. Trying to protect his daughter, Johan has brought the angry grizzly straight to her. Now the bear moves in for the kill. Johan Otter and his daughter Jenna have escaped a savage grizzly by throwing themselves off a mountain. Hot on their trail, the bear is going in for the kill. The animal just wants to get rid of you, to neutralize you, to make you no threat to her cubs. Jenna tries to hide, but Johan faces the predator head on. But I just wanted to make sure it was, you know, away from Jenna. Johan grabs for the nearest weapon, but it turns to dust. And I still remember those two eyes, amber brown, looking straight into my eyes. No feelings. Looking there straight in the eye and continuing to look at them is uh, generally aggressive. <laughs> And it really started chomping down on my arm. It was just ripping it apart. We don't have the physical structure to stand up to even a, a friendly wrestling match with a bear, let alone when they're ticked off and a mom is feeling defensive about her cubs. You have this helpless feeling of, I can't do anything, but you want to help, but you can't do anything. <laughs> The bear goes for the killer bite to his head. Is it's going after a person just like it would another bear. They're aiming for the mouth and the face because they're trying to disable their opponent's weapons. That's their teeth, that's their jaws. The grizzly's canines are about two inches long, made for gripping and tearing. The molars are flat for crushing and grinding. It really felt like I was trying to rip my head up. And the tooth really went into my skull. I could feel this bone cracking. And I remember thinking, okay, one more bite and I'm done. And then I looked down and I'm like, oh, one more fall and I'm dead. But I also knew that if I would stay there, I would be dead. Determined not to die, Johan breaks free and leaps into the void once again. A 
small rocky ledge saves them from certain death. 1,400 feet below. And then I looked up, and the bear kind of was looking over the ledge, basically. I, I couldn't get to me. It was too steep, basically. But the grizzly isn't done yet. It can still smell human flesh. It was just fear of being found, which you know is inevitable. I heard the bear breathing and it's sort of like that stomach churning, like, oh no, kind of feeling. And I must have screamed. China. Worst sound in the world. You've tried to keep this animal with you as long as possible to keep it away from your daughter, and, and still. Jenna is trapped. Its lower jaw was the one that ripped open my mouth, and the upper one was the one that grabbed on my neck. And my whole head was in its mouth. OK, I'm dead. Get it over with. This could be the end of the line for Jenna. <laughs> Johan Otter has escaped a savage grizzly attack by jumping off a mountain. The bear has now turned on his 18-year-old daughter. Face to face with death, Jenna takes a huge gamble. I just tried to be as still as possible so that it would think that I was dead. The playing dead routine works if you can quit moving and if you can remain as silent as possible. That tells the bear, OK, this person is no longer a threat. You can leave. Jenna keeps completely still and silent. Johan has no idea what is happening. I don't hear anything anymore. I mean, it could mean one or two things. One, the animal left my daughter alone, or two, she's dead. Johan doesn't dare make a sound. If the bear has gone, any noise might bring it back. He waits two agonizing minutes, then decides to take a chance. Jenna? That's probably the best feeling. <laughs> I'm sorry. It, it's still, it's still a, a little emotional. Are you okay? I'm okay. Her voice was very strong, sounded very healthy. Oh. Oh, I think I'm banged up pretty bad. And it was going for my head, and then all I feel was just bone, 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 bone. Like, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna feel anymore. That's not good. It's still too early for many hikers to be this far up the trail. Johan uses his nylon jacket to protect his exposed scalp. He needs urgent medical attention. Adrenaline triggered by the attack is draining away. He is going into shock. 
because I was getting a little woozy and I was just shaking, I was so cold. Johan and Jenna's cries are finally heard by other hikers. Two hours later, they're airlifted to the hospital. Johan's spine and neck are broken. His scalp needs a skin graft. He has three broken ribs, a broken nose, and a punctured eye. It takes nine operations and many months for Johan to recover. Jenna also requires surgery and begins university wrapped in bandages. Yeah, you kind of feel guilty in a way, you know, because you've taken your daughter into a dangerous area. Shouldn't have done that. That's when you get a little emotional, like, you know, shoot, I'm doing this to all these people. <laughs> because folks didn't, didn't care. They were happy I was still alive. So. After the attack, experts agree the bear was acting naturally, trying to defend her cubs. They thought she posed no further danger to people, so she was not put down. For thousands of years, bears were America's supreme predators. From Alaska to Mexico, they were top of the food chain. Native Americans were in awe of their ferocious temper and huge strength. Some tribes worshiped bears. They wore their skin and claws as symbols of power. But killing a bear meant hunting in groups. It increased the chance of coming back alive. European settlers, however, were far less cautious. They saw bears as a dangerous pest that preyed on their livestock. Convinced their guns would protect them, they set out to kill as many as possible. And this was the age of the homesteader. And for those people, if they lost a cow, if they lost a couple sheep, you know, it, it was a huge cost for them. In the mid-1800s, prospectors pushed deeper into bear country, looking for gold. Scavenging bears soon learned that where there were people, there were food scraps. Very occasionally, bears also developed a taste for human flesh. Today, there are still freak incidents when bears see humans as prey. In the summer of 1997, Kelly McConnell's life was shattered when a black bear went on one of North America's most horrific bear rampages. It was just trying to eat me. Liard River Hot Springs, British Columbia, a popular place to relax and unwind. It's home to many black bears who feed on food scraps that people leave behind. In rare cases, they can take that terrible next step. It's bears that have been both habituated to people and then food condition that have injured or preyed on people. Like other bears in the park, this male feeds on human leftovers as well as plants and insects and the occasional young animal. An opportunistic predator is almost always hungry, a potentially dangerous situation. Thirteen-year-old Kelly McConnell and his mother, Patty, are moving from Texas to Alaska to start a new life. They're breaking a long trip with a well-earned rest. We're just gonna relax after a long day of driving. Uh, uh, we just wanted to go to the hot springs itself and, and relax.
Even though they know there are bears in the area, Kelly and his mother decide to explore the park. And I actually did comment at that time, I wish that I could see one. And then my mother corrected me and told me that I did not wish I would see one. But Kelly and his mother have no idea of the danger they're in. It's so rare. The bear can smell prey, and it's closing in on them. A predacious attack, by and large, is a slow approach toward you, constant following of you, if you like, waiting for its tactical advantage to come in and, and get on you. Come on, let's go. Kelly, come on. Patty and Kelly have walked into a death trap. Frozen with fear, she has no idea what to do. Kelly. Hi, right, Mom. There's a bear. Yeah, right. I didn't believe what she was saying. She's always fooling around, and I couldn't, I didn't know what to believe. Kelly. Kelly. But it's no joke. Don't move. If it's not making any noise, if it's not making a commotion, and it starts coming at you, this bear's in a predatory mode, and you've got to start thinking about what can I do to defend myself. The 400-pound beast viciously attacks Patty. Both she and Kelly are staring death in the face. This bear could rip them apart in seconds. In a nature park in British Columbia, 13-year-old Kelly McConnell has put his life on the line to save his mother from the jaws of a bear. And I was screaming for help, and there was no one around. I felt so helpless. A bloodthirsty beast tears into Patty. It was trying to eat my mother. Bears don't always kill completely kill their prey before eating. They'll just start eating. And they do that with big game animals, and it's, it's pretty well known that they do it with people, too. Kelly desperately tries to save his mother. But then, in a heartbeat, the bear turns on him. I can just remember thinking, I hope that I save my mother's life, but, but I remember thinking it was all a nightmare. Kelly has become the beast's next meal. The bear locks its powerful jaws around his waist and lifts him off the ground. I can feel the the bones crunching in my body like... I was pretty sure I was gonna die. Kelly's about to pass out, but suddenly the animal drops him. He falls on his front, keeping his vital organs safe from the bear's teeth and claws. They just began mauling me from the backside. It would just bite into my back and just tear, tear my skin. It was... He was eating me. Kelly and his mom are so far from the hot springs, there's a danger no one will hear their screams. But one man does. Ray Kitchen. A truck driver races to the scene 
and heroically takes on the man-eater himself. This is an animal that's obsessively hungry, if not starving to death. And it may see other people that interfere as trying to take the carcass away from them. The bear's reaction is explosive. It turns on Kitchen and begins to eat him alive. Bears sometimes go into what they call surplus killing. They get into a herd of sheep, and it's so easy to kill them, they just knock them over left and right way more than they're ever going to be able to eat. Kelly is too badly wounded to do anything to help. Kitchen is pinned beneath the raging animal. He can do nothing to stop it ripping him to pieces. Tony Dowk, a trucker from Alberta, hears Kitchen screaming and comes to help. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The bear was on Ray Kitchen, mauling him to death. And it stared at me. I was looking at it straight in the eyes. And I hit him dead square in the eyes. claws come up and just miss me because I jump back. Tony is lucky the bear doesn't go after him. Instead, it finally kills Ray Kitchen. I heard Ray scream his last few, or try to scream, you know, the last few thought or sounds that his voice could make. And, uh, I screamed, oh my God, oh my God, and, and that was it. Ray's throat has been ripped open. They're getting the neck because they're going for the windpipe and for the vertebrae. <laughs> Kelly's wounds are so bad, he can't move. Patty is alive, but very weak. She told me that I should take care of my sisters. And, um, and then she told me she loved me. Patty loses consciousness. Other people are drawn by the shouts. They desperately try to keep the furious bear away from Kelly and his mom. Paramedic Ingrid Bailey joins the frantic rescue effort. Mr. Kitchen was just flat out on the ground, missing a big chunk of his neck. And at that point, I stopped trying to do anything for Mr. Kitchen and uh, went over and aided the other two folks who had already been attacked. Ingrid does what she can, even though she could be next. The bear is only a few feet away. It could strike at any moment. The only way to end the carnage is by killing the bear. Keep putting pressure on that <laughs> But this vicious predator is not done yet with its bloody rampage. It has the taste for human flesh and wants more. Black Bear has savagely attacked Patty and Kelly McConnell and killed the man who tried to help them. Now the bloodthirsty bear is on the rampage and heading towards the hot springs. There's panic 
But running bodies trigger the bear's killer instinct. The attraction of moving prey is overrides the feeding. They'll feed later. The massacre won't end until someone kills the crazed beast. Ingrid Bailey is still trying to revive Patty when the bear attacks another victim. He caught up with a group of college students, and the last student in line slipped on the boardwalk, which was a little damp from the light rain, and the bear caught up with that person and mauled him as well. Finally, someone arrives with a gun. The bear is shot dead. Lots of pressure. He's losing a lot of blood. But it's too late for Patty McConnell. She dies of her horrific injuries. Her 13-year-old son, Kelly, just manages to pull through. Both my lungs were punctured. They said there was over 100 centimeters of stitches. I had suffered a few broken ribs. Three of my vertebrae were broken. An attack like this is very rare. Two people are dead and two seriously injured. But incredibly, Kelly doesn't hate the animal that took his mother's life. I feel like the bear, it didn't try to do anything that wasn't normal for it to do. I mean, normally bears don't attack people and, um, and then probably had no choice but to attack or else die from starvation itself. The horrific events at Liard Park show just how helpless we are when these predators turn on us. Without a gun, the death toll could have been much higher. Killing a bear in full attack mode is difficult, even with modern weapons. Back in the 1800s, it was much harder. As Michigan hunter and trapper Franklin Devereaux found out in 1883 when he tried to shoot a grizzly. In the time it took to reload his gun, the enraged bear charged and killed him. Placing a headshot, unless the bear is immobile, is just about impossible. A skull is very hard to handle. You'd have trouble breaking it. In those days, bears were often only injured, and a wounded bear is extremely dangerous stop at nothing to kill its attacker. The invention of the repeating rifle finally gave man the upper hand. When we went from single shot muskets to lever action repeating rifles, that was a huge blow to grizzly bears. And it was both a combination of firepower, how fast you could shoot, and also the power of the weapon. Hunting bears became a popular sport. They were killed in the thousands. Grizzly bear numbers plummeted, and today they are protected by law. But as more hunters and hikers venture into the last remaining wilderness, violent encounters still happen. And when an angry bear attacks, even a modern weapon may not save you. In the summer of 2001, Pastor Johnny McCoy found a gun wasn't enough to protect him from a furious grizzly determined to see him dead. And she was literally just trying to break my skull. Pastor Johnny McCoy and church deacon Gary Coro are old friends who've been hunting together for years. They're on a two-week hunting trip in the Alaskan wilderness. We was going moose hunting to have the meat for the winter, or for the following year. That's what we eat. That's the food for the family. 
They are well aware of the dangers lurking in the woods. While tracking their prey, they soon notice signs of grizzlies. It makes me absolutely nervous walking through the woods, knowing that there are bear there, knowing that we are in their territory. This scat belongs to a female grizzly. She has cubs nearby. McCoy and Coral trek further into the bear's territory. Unlike hikers, they make as little noise as possible. Hunters are probably more prone to bump into bears than other people because they're moving quietly. McCoy takes a break. Coral presses on. Alone, he's much more likely to be attacked. Coral is walking quietly. The grizzly won't see or hear him until it's too late. It was probably just out there with its cubs. All of a sudden, here's these people. So to Ma Grizzly, you see that as a threat. McCoy, meanwhile, hurries to catch up with Coral. Suddenly, something tears out of the trees. It's racing towards Coral. She ran right out within 10 feet in front of me. In my mind, I said, it's a bear. McCoy can't shoot. He could hit Coral. By the time his friend hears a grizzly, it's too late. And as I turned my head and looked around, all I could see was the mouth of a bear, and it was wide open. I just thought that the bear's going to kill me. Today, I'm going to go be with the Lord. At first, Coral's backpack shields him from the deadly claws. The bear was just trying to get the pack out of the way to get it down. I'm thinking my buddy is, you know, my best friend is going to be killed. So I'm saying, God, what do I do? But Coral doesn't panic. Incredibly, he pulls his gun out from under him and points it blindly over his shoulder. It wasn't an easy thing to do. I squashed the trigger and boom. It was instant relief. But a second later, Coral hears a terrifying scream. Church Deacon Gary Coral has been attacked by a grizzly. He shot the bear, making it let go. Now the enraged beast turns on Coral's hunting buddy, Johnny McCoy. When bears are injured during an attack, it seems that pain is a stimulus to attack harder. McCoy reacts with lightning speed. And I just took my gun, I thought, oh my goodness, and shoved it in her mouth. The grizzly bites down. When I shoved that gun in her mouth and pulled the trigger, there was nothing. Absolutely nothing. And then she just swatted out of the way. The grizzly leaps on McCoy with a vengeance, biting deep into his arm and shoulder. And I've never heard any more agonizing screams of horror than the screams that I heard him hear. And first thing that she did was to, um, to bite and break my arms in nine places. 
A grizzly's jaws can exert over 750 pounds of force. It's like being hit by a sledgehammer. Coral can't shoot in case he hits McCoy. He can only watch as the bear tears his friend apart. I could hear the bones crunching. I could actually hear them break. I, I seem to even be able to hear the flesh being ripped off of these bones. McCoy can't fight anymore. His arms are badly mauled. The grizzly now lunges for his head, the death blow. And all I could smell was her breath. It was the most awful stench I've ever smelled in my life. And I thought, okay, you know, God, this is it. You know, Lord, I'm ready, this is it. And I just quit. I just quit. McCoy's body goes limp. And the bear turned around and looked at me. Suddenly, the bear runs off. I think in about one second, he must have covered 100 yards. He was clear out of sight. I never fired a shot. It was so quick. McCoy is in bad shape. I'd already resigned the fact that I was not going to make it. I could have bled to death. Johnny. Johnny. Both his arms are badly injured. His scalp is shredded. His ear is torn off. One eye hangs from its socket. Talk to him. Coral must act quickly to save his friend. Well, we had lots of game sacks. So I took the game sacks and put his scalp back on as good as I could and put his eyeball back in his head and stuffed his ear up in there and tied the game sacks on him. And when I got done, I looked at him and I thought, oh my, I thought, how am I ever going to get him to stand up? McCoy can't see anything. And they've left their cell phone back at the camp. It takes the injured hunters three hours to get there. Eventually, they are airlifted to the hospital. Emotionally, I'm still dealing with that. It, it's tough. If I'm under a lot of stress, uh, my wife has to wake me up because I, you know, I'm, I'm fighting with a bear all over again. I woke up a few times at night thinking about this bear on my back. With the bear tearing him apart, the bones crunching, sure, you don't ever forget that. The grizzly bear was later found dead of the single gunshot wound. Thousands of people encounter bears every year, but attacks are unusual. most likely one of two causes. One, it's a predatory incident, and that happens with both black bears and grizzly bears. And then the second thing is defense of personal space. When bears do strike, it can have a profound and lasting effect on those who are lucky enough to survive. In the blink of an instance, your life can completely be changed without you having any say and what happens? So you should just go out and live every day like it's your last day, because it might be. You just never know. I will never, ever be the same again in a tremendous way.
Mike Monreal was nearly killed when an angry gator savagely attacked him in the water hazard on a Florida golf course. I was slammed from the back. My shoulder wasn't attached anymore. The Tampa Palms Golf and Country Club, Florida. The kind of place people come to kick back and enjoy the high life. But its ponds and lakes are also home to creatures that have barely changed since the dinosaurs. Alligators are very common in Florida. And almost any freshwater system can have alligators in it. And that's one of the things that people need to be aware of, is that just because they haven't seen an alligator in an area doesn't mean there isn't one right now. The lake by hole 13 is the territory of this seven-foot alligator. He's always hungry, and he's not too picky. As long as they can catch it and eat it, almost anything is potential prey. And they'll take things as big as deer occasionally. Golfers on this course are always in striking distance of gators, but no one has been attacked yet. Sixty-two-year-old Ike Monreal owns a golf ball retrieval service, diving for lost balls in the lakes here. He normally pairs up with one of his sons, but today, he's working solo. Well, I get as many as 12,000 balls in a single day. And at this time and point, I was being paid eight cents per ball. Ike's been doing this job for the last 15 years and knows how dangerous it can be. I've been nudged not knowing the alligator was in the water. That happens. They'll stay down for 15, 20 minutes. So I've been bumped, nudged, nipped, tail whipped. Almost all of us divers working in the southeastern United States, we have close calls like that. The gator is getting hungrier by the minute. The hot weather triggers its need to kill and feed. Alligator activity is related to temperature. When temperatures get to their highest, uh, alligators are trying to feed uh, on a very regular basis. That's a big concern for Ike. When I approach a lake, I'll look and make sure I'm the only participant in the water. He sees a familiar sight. Saw the usual seven, seven and a half foot gator that's there all the time. Ike keeps a close eye on the reptile. Females occasionally do attack humans, but it's not as common as, as males. Males get a lot bigger than females. The coast seems clear, but Ike has yet to notice that another gator is also in the pond. And this one is a gigantic 400-pound male. Generally speaking, the larger the alligator, the greater potential problem with a, uh, an attack on a human. Ike gets on with his job. The limited visibility means he can't see the 10-foot gator coming straight at him. A gator determined to protect his new territory. I was just about ready to come out of the water. I had enough air left. Life was good. I was just working away at it. And that's when the gator moves in. All of a sudden, something clicked at the alligator and says, I'm going to go ahead and give this a try. Searing pain shoots through Ike. The horrific force, the slamming effect, the excruciating pain, and I knew it was going to be 
life or death. Like a sledgehammer, the gator's jaws slammed down on his shoulder with 2,000 pounds of pressure. Teeth are very sharp, and they can lacerate and tear. But they don't actually sever like a shark's teeth would do. So uh, an alligator's teeth are mainly meant for holding on. The pain, in all honesty, on a scale of 1 to 10 was an 11. I have never felt that kind of pain before in my life. If the prey item's too big to swallow whole, they'll try and spin off pieces. Ike sees his left shoulder disappear into the gator's jaws. One quick spin, and his arm could be ripped right off. I couldn't bring my arm back to me, so I thought I had already lost my arm. Ike stares right into the eye of a monster. That big, lifeless, dead eye, that look, that eye was right here. I tried getting up and going for the bank. Incredibly, he crawls towards shore with the alligator still latched onto his shoulder. Seeing two golfers nearby, he desperately tries to get their attention. They can barely believe what they're seeing. Ike is fighting for his life. I said to myself, you have got to keep your head together here. Over here. Ike can't last much longer, and he knows it. As well as being ripped apart, he could easily drown. Retrieving golf balls in a pond at a country club in Tampa, Florida, Ike Monreal has been attacked by a vicious 400-pound gator. His screams attract terrified golfers desperate to help save him. The shore is only a few more feet away. Rescue is within grasp. And then Ike's gone. He had such size and girth, he just drug me right back down again. An alligator will try and get the, the victim off balance, trying to drag them out to deeper water. And once it's drowned, then they will dine on it at their leisure. struggles. He needs to make sure that he keeps his oxygen supply. Without it, he will die in minutes. I said to myself, you pass out, the regulator falls out of your mouth, and you're going to die here. That's when I, I prayed to God. For Ike, it's now or never. He needs to do something, and fast. I worked my hand around his snout. I was able to turn into him. My shoulder is as far back into his jaw as it can go. Ike jams his thumb in the reptile's eye. The most vulnerable part of an alligator is probably its eyes. Uh, everything else is pretty well protected. But the move barely phases the gator. Well, an alligator might expect to have slight pressure to its eye if it, if it grabs a, a large prey item. Ike could be seconds from dying. He reaches back with everything he's got. That's when I stuck my thumb as far back into his eye and is down as far as I could. The move stuns the gator. But then when he went further in, this was something that was totally unexpected by the alligator. He just went ballistic. The bite got worse. And that's when he tried to roll me. They will uh, grab a hold of an appendage and then spin in the water to try and get that appendage uh, torn off. 
He's in so much pain, I can't keep his thumb in the gator's eye socket. I was thinking that it was, it was, you know, the demise, the end was there. I saw my wife and my three teenage sons looking down at me. And I said, that's not gonna work. I said, I am not gonna die out here. I am not gonna give up. Whatever it takes, I'm coming out of the water. Luckily, the fight takes them into the shallows. At last, Ike can get a foothold. Now he can stop the gator from rolling him. I was not going to let him kill me. I was not going to let him drown me. And then Ike goes in for another attack. I certainly wasn't going to let him sit there and twist off whatever he had in his mouth. I took my thumb again, took a deep breath, and slammed into his eye socket. And I swear I got halfway to his brain. Alligators can feel and react to pain. They don't like that. Against all odds, the giant's jaws finally snap open. Ike seizes the opportunity and desperately tries to get out of the water. They learn very fast and probably realize this was not the type of thing that that it wanted to pursue. Ike scrambles onto the bank before the gator changes his mind and comes back. I looked up at the, the gentleman that was standing on the green. I said, just make sure he doesn't come out of the water after me. I said, I don't think I can handle another bite. The alligator swims away. He went out into the deeper part of the swamp. And at that point, I knew I was safe. Are you all right? Are you OK? He dislocated my shoulder. My shoulder wasn't attached anymore. There were teeth holes an inch across, an inch and a half deep over the shoulder. It's bad, but things could have been far worse. Ike's 17-year-old son had originally been scheduled to work that day. He wouldn't have had the size or the experience. The horrific fact of all of this is I would have lost my son. Ike may never fully regain the use of his arm. He and his sons have not returned to the water since the attack. My sons do not dive anymore. My business is Ike and sons. My boys I'll not let go in the water anymore. So do I want to get even? You betcha. Four hours after the attack, a state licensed trapper captures an eight foot alligator from the lake, 50 feet from the scene of the crime. If we didn't do that, there is no doubt there would be a lot more attacks because alligators become habituated and if they have a successful attack, they'll come back for another one. Ike doesn't believe the trapper got the one that wanted him as prey. I think she trapped the smaller, the seven and a half, eight footer that was there. And I do not think to this day that it was that smaller gator. In that case, the gator that nearly killed him is still out there. Alligators can prove lethal in the southern US, but in Africa and Australia, the biggest threat to humans is their deadlier cousin. Crocodiles kill as many as 200 people every year. The largest and most aggressive is a saltwater crocodile, a powerful reptile that can outlive humans and grow to more than 20 feet in length. Despite the name, their natural habitat is actually freshwater rivers and swamps. What makes them so deadly is their uncanny camouflage. In September 1872, Australian Constable William Davis decided to break police regulations and take a refreshing swim in Darwin Harbor. Davis spotted a log floating some distance out and swam over to it. 
Suddenly, the log started swimming towards him, very quickly. Davis soon realized it was a saltwater crocodile that had left the river and headed into the harbor. But it was too late. As Davis started to swim away, the croc zeroed in, its jaws crashing down on his head. Constable William Davis became the first police fatality in Australia's Northern Territory. More than a hundred years later, amateur diver Jeff Tanswell was also savaged by a saltwater croc. It turned a snorkeling trip into a bloody battle for his life. And it was screaming, don't let him eat me, just don't let him eat me. Northern Australia. Protected by law, the saltwater croc population has swelled nearly 5,000% over the last 30 years to as many as 150,000. They are man-eaters, and no stretch of water anywhere is safe. On a tidal river, this 12-footer is looking for its next meal. The diet consists usually of, of fish and crabs, crustaceans, small mammals, that kind of thing. But an 18-foot crocodile can drag down a buffalo if he really wants to. Although he normally hunts in rivers, today he heads out into the open sea. People have seen saltwater crocodiles swimming past oil rigs and past boats just in the middle of the ocean. So what's this crocodile doing? It's just swimming from one point to another. On Thursday Island, at the northern tip of Queensland, 37-year-old police sergeant Jeff Tanswell and his wife Jane, also a trained police officer, are hitting the water for a day of fun in the sun. My entire life I've been brought up by the water. So we've always been brought up um, with boats and diving and fishing, and that's just second nature. If we go fishing or we'd just go out and have a look and jump out on a reef. Hi! Hey. Hi! Today, they plan on doing some spear fishing with their friends Amanda and Dave. They head towards the remote Adolphus Islands, an hour away. We hadn't been there before, so this is going to be another opportunity for us to explore. The ocean around here is dangerous. We're a bit, I guess, aware of the possibility of sharks being in the water. It's something that's uh, always stored in the back of your, your head. Let's just enjoy the ride, but let's be aware. Keep an eye out for a shark. The last thing on Jeff's mind is running into an aggressive saltwater croc. All I knew was that crocodiles uh, inhabit the coastline and they need to go from river to river to river. And they do not go out to sea. And that was what I was brought up with. But he's wrong, dead wrong. A wandering killer croc is also headed to the Adolphus Islands on a collision course with Jeff's party. They pull into a coral reef and scout for any signs of predators. We were making sure that there was no sharks or anything in the water that we that was dangerous, but we didn't see any sharks. If there's going to be a shark, he's going to be patrolling the deep water. So I'm not going to go there. I'm going to take the safer option, and I'm going to go in closer to the coast. Amanda and Dave are the first ones in. Because they're entering unfamiliar waters, Jeff asks his wife to stay on board. You have to leave someone on the boat just for safety. If you catch a fish, if it bleeds, you don't want to have fish blood in the water, it could attract sharks. So if they catch a fish or crayfish or something, they just hold it up and I start the boat, go over. 
Jeff enters deep in an alien world where he is both the hunter and the potential prey. You can see the, all the little uh, colorful fish dancing around in, in amongst all this brightly lit coral. I saw the, the other two diving with us. They started heading out a bit wide. And I remember thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm not comfortable diving out to where the coral edge is, where it drops off into the deeper water, because sharks could come and go. But sharks are not the problem. The hungry 12-foot saltwater croc is closing in. I remember a little voice in the back of my head going, there could be other big things out here. The giant croc quietly stalks Jeff and his friends. It's breeding season, and like all crocs, he's more aggressive than usual. Jeff heads up for air. I just thought I'd been hit by a boat. The fear that a predator instills in its prey is it's, it's bottomless. No matter how fast you move, if a crocodile's head is half a meter from you and it strikes, you cannot possibly get away. Jane can't quite make out what's going on. And it all happened within a matter of split second. I remember staring at that bit of water going, did I just see what I saw, or is that my imagination? The crocodile clamps down on Jeff's head. And I've become aware of this pressure on my head, this, this, this crushing pressure on my head. The crocodiles have got the strongest jaw muscles of any animal that we know for their size. They've got about 66, sometimes 68 teeth in their jaws. They'll puncture through, fe through flesh, they'll go through shell, and they'll even go into bone. Jeff is dragged down with his head ripped open. He's bleeding heavily and running out of air. He's just gone down with no splash, no screaming, no kicking. Jeff! I had no feeling of, of the water, the temperature, sounds, everything, sight, everything was gone. They've got the power just to shut down your entire system and you don't have a say in it. It was a, a mixture of just horror as well as just total disbelief. You're on a, on a remote tropical coral island. You, you're not looking for a, a crocodile. Jane starts the boat to stop it drifting. She has absolutely no idea that her husband below is being drowned by a giant croc. I could feel by my neck muscles that he's pulling me down to the sea floor by, by my head. That is one of the things that a crocodile will do if it wants to overpower its prey. Most animals can't hold their breath for anything like as long as a crocodile can. Jeff knows he can't stay under for more than a couple of minutes. I'm trying to stop what's going on, but I, I can't. He's, he's just too big, too strong. I remember kicking madly with my fins. You're just in overload. I don't know if it's adrenaline or what, it's all your senses trying to work overtime to save you. And then, a miracle. I remember seeing the jaws release and the sudden burst of light, and I was just shocked to the surface. I saw his head come up and him blow the water out of his snorkel. Jeff has no idea where the croc is and when it might bite again. Well, what was going through my head was that his big block head coming back up and, and grabbing my legs. And then just behind his head, I thought I saw something moving. The killer croc surfaces inches away, closing in on his prey. I can feel the warm uh, blood running down the side of my face. He's got the teeth, he's got the scales, he's got, he's, got, he's got the claws, he's got everything. You have nothing. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I just, it was the most unexpected thing. 
I remember looking at this thing and then the brains kicked into gear going, we've got to try and survive this. The croc slowly circles. It sizes up Jeff from every angle. It could rip him apart at any moment. If the prey is large, then it will produce what's known as the death roll. And then it spins its entire body. I mean, if a crocodile grabs me on the arm and starts to spin, the weak point here is at the elbow or at the shoulder, and that's where it will dislocate. We all know that these things come back to finish you off. Jeff realizes he may only have minutes to live. Police Sergeant Jeff Tanswell has been brutally attacked by a saltwater crocodile in Queensland, Australia. And now his wife Jane, also a trained officer, is desperate to save him before the croc finishes him off. Straight away you just think, this is it. Someone's gonna die here. I just had to try and get him out of the water. Jeff's frantic movements are only making matters worse. He needs to get back to the boat before the reptile returns for more. If you splash and splash and splash, the croc can feel that, it can hear it, and it's, it's more likely to attract it back to the place. I stuck my head in the water a couple of times, just trying to see where the hell he went. Next minute, I had the boat beside him, and I was helping him in the boat from the left-hand side of the boat. I don't know how I pulled him out of the water. I think it was just a pure adrenaline. Open your eyes. Look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm right here, okay? Concerned about their friends, Jane swings the boat around to the other side of the bay and finds Amanda and Dave unharmed. But the monster croc is still somewhere below. Everyone may be safely in the boat, but Jeff's wounds are serious. I got a puncture hole in, in my left cheek. I got a laceration on, on my left temple. Uh, the left ear was torn. And I got lacerations on, uh, behind both my ears where the, where the teeth went in and scratches on, on, on my back where his claws went in. It's essential Jeff gets to the hospital as quickly as possible, but they are a good hour away from the coast. He could have a brain injury. He could have some sort of compression on his brain. He could have a stroke. He could also be infected by the croc. All his teeth are covered in mud, covered in bacteria. It's a breeding ground for bacteria. If that crocodile then bites you, it drives those bacteria deep into your flesh, and it can cause a much bigger problem than the bite itself. Crocs kill as many as 200 people a year. And right now, Jeff looks like he might join that gruesome club. We got to the hospital and went straight into the emergency room. I had all my wounds scraped and washed out, which was quite painful. And then they microsurgery my ear and stitched everything back together. He owes his life to Jane's quick rescue and pure luck. Certainly, if it wanted to kill him, it would have. Jeff knows all too well how close he came to death. And there is nothing as terrifying as realizing that, that this thing is going to come along and eat you, and you can't do a thing about it. No further attacks were reported in the Adolphus Island region that summer. Most likely, the saltwater crocodile returned to the coast and headed upriver. The worst saltwater croc attack is said to have happened in World War II during the Battle of Ramri Island in Burma. Surrounded by British troops, a group of Japanese soldiers desperately tried to escape through mangrove swamps infested with saltwater crocs. The next morning, only 20 survivors were found. Nearly 400 may have been devoured by the hungry crocs. The Guinness Book of World Records ranked the attack as the worst animal disaster in history. 
crocodiles are by no means the most dangerous animal in the water. That title falls to the hippo, Africa's most deadly creature. Weighing as much as a small pickup truck, hippos kill around 200 people in Africa each year. For millennia, they have been a deadly threat to people living throughout Africa. The mighty Egyptians had the most to fear. Hippos used to live all along the Nile, the lifeblood of their civilization. They were a danger to boats and to people working on the river's edge. The animals were considered so powerful, they were associated with gods. Kings hunted them from royal ships. It was a brutally dangerous sport. In around 3100 BC, Menes, the first king of unified Egypt, is said to have been carried off and killed by a hippopotamus during such a hunt, ending his 62-year reign. More than 5,000 years later, while leading a river safari in Zimbabwe, guide Paul Templer also found out just how brutal a hippo attack can be. I had tusks going through me every which way but loose. There was a lot of blood in the water. You could see it had been quite badly bitten. Oh. The Zambezi, one of the largest rivers in Africa and home to this huge male hippo. The lone bull is particularly aggressive. It probably recently lost a fight with another male and was thrown out of its pod or herd. And now he's viciously protecting his new territory. Hippos respond the same way we would if someone repeatedly broke into our homes, with extreme aggression. The bachelor bull has attacked seven people in the last few months, defending its turf. And he's more than ready to do it again. Zimbabwe River guide Paul Templer is enjoying a quiet afternoon off when he's unexpectedly asked for a special favor. Hey, I was sitting in the pub when uh, the folks came in and said, hey, we need a guide. So now I had a tough choice to make. Do I spend the rest of my day sitting in the pub or do I go and lead the canoes far? No, for today. Um, I went and led the canoe safari. It's a decision he would soon regret. Good afternoon, guys. My name is Paul. We have a crew responsible for taking you down this, uh, this amazing river this afternoon. It's going to be a fantastic. Paul afternoon. is joined by three other guides Ben, Evans, and his close friend, Mike McNamara. It's a trip they've done lots of times before. The trip itself is what we call a wine route. It's one of the trips where the, the guests don't actually paddle themselves. And the idea is that they just relax and watch the sun go down. It's a sunset trip, it lasts about an hour and a half. The idea was just to sit back and relax and take in everything that uh, nature had to offer. Paul is on the lookout for the rogue hippo that has attacked seven others over the last few months. He's already had his own nasty run-in with the three-ton monster. About six months prior to this, I'd been leading a similar canoe safari, and I'd been attacked by a big, brute hippo. The hippo had smacked the bottom of Paul's canoe, catapulting him and two passengers into the water. That time, they had escaped unharmed. I knew that that hippo was in the area, and uh, though I couldn't see him, I thought going through the narrow channels would be my safest option. And so far, so good. As they come around the bend, Paul notices a large pod of hippos. They weren't really a concern. They were off to the side, and I could see them, and I felt that I had a pretty good sense of what they were up to. <laughs> They proceed cautiously, making sure they don't startle the hippos. Paul also scans the water 
for any that are submerged. Occasionally you'll get ears, occasionally you'll get a head, occasionally you'll get the whole body. Um, then there'll be nothing. They'll all disappear underwater. You watch the water, the water's moving differently. If there's a couple of ton hippo moving around beneath it. All seems to be going well. They safely get past the pod into faster moving water. And then... I turned just in time to see Evans flying through the air. Likely it's the same rogue hippo from underwater who surfaced like a giant torpedo and knocked Evans clear out of the boat. Paul watches in horror as the current drags Evans away. Evans went under and then popped up again. Paul paddles full speed towards Evans. I turn my canoe around, so I'm going backwards, so I'm between whatever's there and him. I back in to try to rescue him. Paul reached for him with a paddle, shouting to him to grab the paddle so that he can pull him out. I'm probably four or five feet away from him when I see this, this bow wave cruising in towards me. And it was at that point where the hippo just erupted next to Paul. While he's trying to help his friend, the hippo turns on Paul and attacks. Just all hell broke loose. The hippo just closed its jaws on his upper torso and pulled him off the boat. The hippo tries to swallow Paul whole. They attack the boats not because they recognize I will get to the people in here, but because they recognize it as a foreign object that needs to be removed. I remember this incredible pressure crushing down on my lower back. Hippos are not interested in eating the people that, that get attacked. It's an aggressive reflex of, if I encounter something with my jaw, I will crush it. So the crushing comes from the hydraulic press that is their jaw, um, somewhere on the order of maybe 1,800 pounds. What the canines do is act as hole punchers. They can go through anything. They are strong, they are massive, they are sharp. Paul is kicking and clawing for his life. He needs to get out from the mouth of the beast. Evans also needs urgent help. He's in danger of drowning in the strong currents. There's nothing fellow guide Mike can do. We couldn't get to Evans because the hippo was in the way. Finally, Paul's aggressive struggling pays off. Pushed, pulled. At one point, the monster loosened his grip long enough for me to escape. I just sucked in a lung full of fresh air, and I came face to face with Evans. But Evans doesn't look right at all. I got the sense that, that all was not wrong. He wasn't going anywhere. I think terror and panic had quite literally overwhelmed him. For Evans, it's too late. He's drowned in the strong current. He literally just rolled his eyes up and he sank and he was dead. And that's when the hippo zeroes in on Paul again. At this point, it was all up to the hippo, and really, there's nothing you can do. This time, the hippo is clamped down on Paul's legs, tearing into skin and bones. The hippo started the attack and was not going to finish the aggressive behavior until the intruders were gone. It happened very quickly. And you could see that it was a serious attack, that it was, there was going to be some serious injuries out of this. They don't just try to win, they try to destroy their opponent. One of the clients watching later said that it was like watching a vicious dog, literally just trying to rip apart a rag dog. These huge tusks tearing through my torso as he, as he drove me underwater. So I had tusks going through me every which way but loose. He bit down so hard that I thought for sure he was going to bite me in half. The hippo has speared Paul badly, and now he starts dragging him down to drown him. I remember lying on the bottom of the river and looking up. I remember I could see the different hues of green and yellow and the sunlight shining on the water surface. 
Then I thought to myself, I wonder who can hold their breath the longest. Paul is close to death. Most humans can't go without breathing for much more than a minute, while the hippo can stay under five times longer. Fighting for territory is just second nature to hippos, and fighting to the death is second nature. They don't hold back at all. I watched my blood mingle with the water, and I just wondered which would happen first, if I'd bleed to death or if I'd drown. During a bloody hippo attack in Zimbabwe, Africa, one man has died while another, river guide Paul Templer, has been gored by the creature's teeth and dragged to the river floor. And now, Paul is also drowning. All anyone can do is look on helplessly. The amount of blood that was in the water showed that Paul had been bitten very badly. There's no sign anywhere of Paul. There's no way he could have survived the second attack. I didn't think I'd see him again. And then Paul popped up. But then the hippo spat me out again, giving me another chance to escape. Barely alive, Paul is bleeding badly. Mike guns forward on his kayak to save him. He knows there's not a second to lose. I was just shouting to him to grab the front of the kayak. I managed to grab a hold of the handle on the boat's nose. For a moment, Paul seems safe. But the hippo comes back for more. It tries to chomp down on Paul's dangling legs. Any second, he'll be dragged down again. He was hitting and thrashing, and it, it, was, it was not good. I knew I didn't have much left in me. He can barely hold on. One arm is shredded. Both shoulders are punctured with bites. On, but astoundingly, the hippo backs off. They're very unlikely to actually come into shallower water to follow an attack. It just, it, it's not what they do. To get to the shallows, Mike has to fight the current. Paul is losing his grip. I was bleeding profusely. I was getting weaker. Paul hangs on. Mike paddles wildly. It's a race against time. I paddled to a point where there was a tuft of grass on a small rock sticking out of the river. The longer it lasted, the more it sapped my energy. Finally, they reach the shallows. I, I don't know how we do it, but Mag, Mac uh, dragged me out of there. The hippo then stopped the attack, moved back, um, and popped up, but not actually following us into the shallower water. Out of his element, the hippo gives up the chase. Oh, I got you, buddy. Just hang in there. Paul is barely alive. Oh, hang in, look at me. Look at me, buddy. Just keep breathing. We got you. He needs medical attention desperately. To make matters worse, the first aid kit and a radio have both washed away. His arm, from what we could see without ripping the sleeve off, had been bitten through the bone two or three times. It was shattered. And a bite mark through the shoulder that you could virtually see daylight through. He was bitten through the foot. You look at me. Look at me, Paul. Look at me. Stay with me. Something that's Mike and fellow guide Ben try to stop Paul from bleeding to death. And started literally putting pressure on, on arteries to try and just stem the bleeding that was still coming. I can feel my legs from the blood. Thinking fast, Mike uses the only thing available, cling wrap from the safari meals. They seal all visible puncture wounds on Paul's chest. Mike and Ben lift Paul into a canoe. When I put him in the boat and sent him off, I thought he was going to die. He definitely didn't look as though with those injuries he could survive. The only way out is right through the killer hippo's territory. 
what we're seeing is an animal under stress. The first time that someone breaks into your house, maybe you won't fight them off. The second time, maybe you'll fight them off a bit more. By the 10th time, you know, you're armed and ready to go. But as we were pulling out and this angry hippo was still there, I thought for sure he was going to come and finish me off. But the hippo chooses to stay put, and Paul is quickly taken downriver. By chance, along the way, they meet a local medical crew conducting emergency drills. There's a shock trauma team who are just practicing. Just go figure a couple of minutes away. They take Paul on an eight-hour drive to the hospital, where he learns that his arm is beyond repair. They took off part of the arm. They took it off just above uh, the elbow to start with. Um, I got gas gangrene, which meant that my body was rotting from the inside. So they ended up having to chop more of me off. In the end, his arm is amputated. Mike and the river raft clients are rescued later that night. A search party is sent out for Evans. It was a full two days before we found his body quite a bit further downstream, but it washed out. The rogue hippo is never found. Animal attacks are rare. People are fair game, but we aren't a normal prey item for them. On a canoeing holiday in the Canadian wilderness, the Dalventhal family was savagely attacked by a lone wolf. There was nothing we could do to stop a wolf that wanted to eat us. Algonquin Park, Ontario. A vast landscape of forests, lakes, and rivers a popular destination for hikers and nature lovers, and home to predators, including the eastern wolf. The conventional wisdom in North America is that wolves are basically harmless. But it became crystal clear that there were circumstances under which the wolves would be dangerous. This adult wolf has been expelled from his pack Forced to fend for himself, he's become an opportunistic predator, scavenging kills and raiding campsites. And he's starting to lose his natural fear of people. That's it. Just keep paddling straight on in. How you doing, guys? Yeah, just follow me in. <laughs> the Dalventhal family is near the end of a nine-day canoe trip some of the park's most remote areas. All right, then. We wanted to get away from people, get um, away from human contact, really get as much as possible into nature to appreciate it as a family. Yeah, dig right in there. It had been one of the best trips, probably one of the high points of, of our lives together as a family. As the day ends, the Dalventhals look for a place to set up camp. Yeah, Tracy, come on right over here. The perfect spot, isn't it? Great job, guys. They're unaware that something else has also picked this site. Get ourselves a camp set up, fire going. The wolf gravitated to the campsite because that was a place where in the past it may have smelled food, experienced food. Although both parents just want to kick back and relax. Their older boys have plans of their own. We wanted to go out on the water and see the sunset. And our parents had very strict rule that uh, me and my brother Eli were not allowed out in the canoes without one of them in the canoe. So we needed to convince one of our parents to go out with us. What do you say, Mom? We're going to stay here and make dinner, and you boys go ahead. Tom and his two older sons set off in the canoe. He has no idea a hungry wolf may now be sizing up their little brother. About 80% of the attacks are aimed at children. And children are being taken while they are still struggling and screaming and are being carried off.
As Tom and his boys paddle further away from their campsite, they bump into other canoeists who tell them about an old Algonquin Park tradition. You ready? Let's do it. The wolf call. We sort of bunched all the canoes together and started howling, you know, more or less in unison, um, doing our best to sound like wolves. <laughs> when you howl, you let the pack know that you are another wolf and you're encroaching on its territory. The lone wolf closes in, possibly worried that rivals may attempt to steal his tempting evening meal. The forest around the site was really thick. You couldn't see into the forest at all. And I heard something and just saw the side of something. Tom arrives back with his older sons. The wolf is likely scared away for now. Hi, right, boys, time for bed. You got a long day tomorrow. It's been such a perfect evening that Tom and Tracy decide not to pitch the tents. The Delventhals will sleep under the stars. But sleeping outside makes the family vulnerable. My mom put Willem, who was only three, in between me and Eli, you know, who were considerably larger than him. Me, Willem, and Eli were down in our own little group. And I am going to sleep like a log. Tom and I we were lying out under the stars and agreed that it was the most peaceful, grounded, um, safe, that we've ever felt in our lives. And I talked about how blessed we were, that this was a glorious place. There is something quite wonderful about lying down and seeing the stars. But I was 12, and I was a little bit more scared of the world and scared of the dark. The ravenous wolf bides his time. He waits until the family is still. His sights are firmly set on the children. I was dreaming that I was walking through the woods with my parents. And it was sunny, and we were just sort of walking and talking. Finally, the wolf makes his move. He zeroes in on the most accessible prey, Zack. While I was dreaming, there was definitely a sensation of pressure on my face. The wolf, as a killing machine, is extremely powerful. They really slice through tissues and meat and muscles and tendons. It's very severe. Incredibly, Zach keeps on sleeping. And it felt like I was being um, dragged. <laughs> it felt like I was sort of strapped to the front of a jet. Everything started rushing by really, really quickly. And that was the point when I woke up. Startled. The wolf runs back into the forest. Just one long, ripping scream. It was blood curling. Zach! Zach, what's wrong? What's wrong? What is it? He kept saying something bit me. What is it? But they still have no idea what bit him. It was at that point that my thermals were getting wet and warm. And he started saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And so I realized that he was bleeding profusely from the face. I sat there trying to gather myself, and I looked through the darkness to where they were huddled together, and then I saw the wolf. Yeah! Yeah! Go on! I was being as 
big as I could be and as loud as I could be. I had to get away from my wife and child. He ran right past us and we could hear it running into the woods and whacking trees and bushes and stuff. And I was trying to hold Zach and figure out what was going on. The animal retreats. The wolf! And I immediately started panicking. I couldn't kill the whole family. <laughs> I kept just pulling him down and whispering, you have to stay calm. We have to stay calm, we have to stay quiet, we have to know where it is. But with only a flashlight, the family has no idea where the wolf is hiding, whether it's vanished or simply biding its time. Wolves have a marvelous tapetum lucidum, which is the technical name for a membrane in the back of the eye which reflects light. And so wolves can see at night much better than we can. The wolf is probably watching the family's every move. He will choose the best moment to resume his attack. I thought we were all gonna die. I thought that there was nothing we could do to stop a wolf that wanted to eat us. On a canoeing trip to Algonquin Park, Ontario, the Delventhal family has fought off a savage attack by a lone wolf. They're terrified it will strike again. The first thing I found was, was my paddle was the biggest of all of the paddles. Yeah. Yeah. And I went back to where he had disappeared um, and stood there for about uh, half a minute until I was satisfied that um, he was gone. My dad came up in front of me and shone the light in my face. Let me see, let me see. Let me see, let me see his eyes. The first thing I saw was the terror and the fear in his eyes. And I could see that his cheek was totally torn through. I just kind of stopped and said, oh my god. I mean, it was slow and it was horrified and hopeless. And it was all there, and the, oh my god, and the look on his face. And I knew it was worse than I thought it was. Again, the hungry wolf emerges from the forest. Now he moves in for the kill. And my dad turned and charged in and followed it out into the woods. It was really scary, but I was gonna beat him. I was gonna destroy him. Yeah! Yeah, go on! Get out of here! The trees wrapped around him and he was gone. He disappeared. I thought if he doesn't come back, how am I going to protect these kids on my own? My immediate thought was that I wasn't going to see him again. It was darkest night I can ever remember, but my all of my senses were were really, really sharpened, and I felt like um, I could see exactly where he was. Yeah! Armed with his makeshift weapon, Tom now has the upper hand. Wolves, in all their killing activities, have to respect one thing. They're basically hypochondriacs. Safety for them is paramount. Self-preservation wins over hunger. The animal retreats for now. Seizing the moment, the Delventhals make their escape. Okay, right on there. Right, get, get out of here. 
Because I knew, at least, the wolf couldn't get us now. The family may have escaped the wolf's jaws, but Zack is still in terrible danger. He's losing blood fast. Hey, Zach, hold on. Hold on, Zach. You're all right. I thought about dying, so I just sort of peacefully lying in the boat and, and figured I could slip away now and, and it would be easy. What changed my thinking was thinking about my family and thinking about how much they would all miss me. I was very aware that he might have lost a lot of blood um, and that there was a lot further to go. We couldn't find our way out. And um, that was just feeling like uh, uh, incredible powerlessness on my part. I was really angry at myself, frustrated with myself, and frustrated with the situation. After three long hours, the family sees a glimmer of light. They arrive at a lodge, but the hospital is still another four hours away. Zach undergoes four hours of emergency surgery. His nose is broken in five places, and it takes over 80 stitches to repair his badly lacerated face. Sheer luck that the wolf didn't grab part of the neck. With the tremendous bite force of the wolf, Zach would not have survived that. I'm very lucky. They took Zachariah into a, a triage room, and um, it was that moment, it was the first time that I looked at him because I thought, okay, now we're safe, and I can see. And his face was just ripped apart. Even after the doctor had Zach and was doing what he could to, to put Zach's face back together again, the reaction was, um, well, it couldn't have been a wolf. And, and they treated me very much like I was hallucinating uh, or just a... a stupid geek from the city or, you know, somebody who just didn't understand, obviously, because wolves don't do that. The scars themselves really aren't that visible. The psychological trauma leads to months of severe panic attacks. The therapist said, what happened is deep and primal because you're supposed to be safe when you're asleep. He didn't know it was coming. None of us knew it was coming. Park rangers decide the lone wolf poses a serious threat to other campers. Five days after the attack, they find the animal they believe terrorized the Delventhals and shoot it dead. But Zach doesn't blame the wolf for what happened. I'm not really any more or less afraid of wolves than I was before. And I have a great respect for them and a great admiration for them but they're always potentially dangerous. Throughout history, wolf attacks have been the stuff of nightmare and legend. No ordinary creatures. In mythology, they often represented evil, even the Antichrist. Not even death could safeguard people from the wolf's jaws. In 16th century Scotland, bodies were often buried on islands to stop wolves digging them up and eating them. No European settlement, it seemed, was safe. In 1879, 
in a village in southern Finland. A pair of wolves went on a bloody rampage. As many as 35 children were killed. Eventually, the Finnish army was called in, but the wolves proved elusive. It took two long years to halt their terrifying reign. The female wolf was shot dead. The alpha male poisoned. By hunting in packs, wolves are highly efficient killers. Sometimes not even a gun will stop them dead. A woodsman living in Springfield, Missouri in the early 1900s learned this the hard way. Ambushed by a furious wolf pack, he fought a heroic battle for his life, but overpowered before he could reload his rifle. He was later found ripped apart, surrounded by five dead wolves. Ever since the first white settlers arrived in North America, wolves have been relentlessly hunted and killed. But in their place, their canine cousin, the coyote, has flourished. Increasingly, the ever-adaptable coyote has moved into urban areas. And increasingly, humans come face to face with them. One afternoon in his yard, Jimmy Hawthorne ran into a wild coyote, a coyote with rabies. I couldn't believe what was happening. I knew I'd be bitten. It was scary. This coyote has lost all sense of reality. He's suffering from rabies. The disease in his brain has eradicated any fear of people. All he wants to do is attack. Most likely, the coyote encountered a rabid raccoon. They tangled, and the raccoon bit the coyote. The rabid animal has left his natural habitat behind. He's now in the residential neighborhood of Lanaxa, Virginia and is a deadly threat to anyone who crosses his path. Forty-seven-year-old Jimmy Hawthorne is working in his yard on a lazy Sunday afternoon. His wife is inside, taking a nap. It was a normal day. I was actually using the lawnmower to blow the leaves off the yard. Jimmy is completely unaware that he's being watched. I probably see coyotes once a month, and then when they see you, they're gone. They're scared of humans. But not this coyote. <laughs> Driven by the lethal virus, he's desperate to bite anything or anyone. Rabies virus uh, infection is transmitted in the saliva and uh, often deposited in skin, subcutaneous tissues, or muscle, and then eventually uh, uh, spreads along nerves to the central nervous system. The diseased coyote closes in on Jimmy. I was just sort of in my own little world, riding on a piece of equipment, and it startled me. I mean, my first thought was it was a German Shepherd. And then I looked and I said, oh my goodness, it's a coyote. Horrified, Jimmy realizes this coyote is rabid. At that point, it was just terror, scary. Rabies is almost always fatal, if not treated immediately. Well, there have only been six survivors of rabies. We don't fully understand uh, why the outcome is always fatal, but clearly the immune response isn't sufficient to clear the viral infection. It was driving the mole as fast as it would go. The coyote was having no trouble keeping up. The coyote kept circling the mole. Fueled by a wave of aggression, the coyote seizes opportunity and strikes. He 
bit my boot. I, I, I felt him bite the boot. I mean, I couldn't believe what was happening. I just remember that moment of fear, of terror. It was scary. Luckily, the coyote's bite doesn't pierce Jimmy's thick leather boot. Jimmy needs to make it home before it does. But then, his mower runs out of gas and stops dead. My thoughts were, oh my goodness, it's something scares you to death. And then it's, it's like you have to take care of yourself, protect yourself. Jimmy must either risk running for his life or taking on the rabbit animal. This animal might weigh 50 pounds and I weigh 240. If it gets bad enough, you know, I'll, I'll just tear him apart with my hand. But I knew I'd be bitten. You don't see animals come up to you. I mean, I've been in the woods my whole life. Deer don't walk up to you. Rabbits don't walk up to you. This animal had no fear of man. He would come around the tractor. You know, I, I didn't want him to bite me on the back of my leg, and I just turned around and faced him, and he came at me, and I kicked him. Hit. That's when he sort of hollered, yipped, and went into the thicket. Because of his swelling brain, the rabid coyote is suffering terrible headaches. Jimmy's kick further disorients him. Jimmy's bought some time. But only a little. I looked around and found a big stick about eight foot long. And I said, well, I can use this to keep him off of And he was aggressive, extremely aggressive. Coyotes, canine teeth, are so much longer than, say, a Doberman. They're prepared to hunt and kill. Wielding the stick, Jimmy scores a direct hit to the coyote's head. The crazed animal retreats for now. Jimmy races for the house, but the door is locked. His wife still asleep. And the rabid coyote isn't yet done with Jimmy. I'm knocking on the door, and then I see him running across the front yard coming back. The ever more aggressive coyote closes in for the kill. <laughs> While mowing his lawn one Sunday afternoon, Virginian Jimmy Hawthorne is fought off an attack by a rabid coyote. <laughs> Locked out of his house, Jimmy's now trapped by the deadly animal. A rabies victim suffers agonizing spasms in the throat, making it almost impossible to swallow. They develop neurological impairment and paralysis, finally progressing to coma, then death. Jimmy pounds on the door one last time to wake up his wife. And thank goodness she got the door open. And I went in, and, and I told her there's a rabbit coyote out there. And I was looking for a gun. The coyote refuses to give up. The rabies has infused him with blind courage. All he knows is he needs to bite. Jimmy has to end the battle now. In the initial stages, it's panic, fear, terror. Honey, you stay inside. You're scared. And then that went away. It goes from fear to aggression. It almost makes you angry. 
Leaving the sanctuary of home, Jimmy goes in search of the deranged animal. But this time, he's prepared. Just a reflex action, I shot him. Oh, he killed him. When the animal is tested, experts confirm the rabies virus. Thankfully, Jimmy is healthy. But the psychological trauma remains. When I'd go to bed, I'd close my eyes and I would see the coyote coming at me. Now, when doing the gardening, Jimmy and his wife are always on guard, just in case. When the news originally did the story, when it, when it happened, they, they said, how do you feel about that? And I said, well, you know, I would have rather been a, a lottery winner. <laughs> so. It was amazing to me how everything is nice. You're at home. It's a Sunday. You're working on your property. Everything's calm, and then everything turns into chaos. It's scary. <laughs> Rabies has terrified people for thousands of years. In the 16th century, a deadly epidemic swept across Europe. Stories of horrific attacks by mad animals foaming at the mouth entered popular folklore. Peasants in the countryside faced the greatest risk, but not even cities were safe. In 1450 in Paris, a pack of wolves, some probably rabid, created blind panic when they breached the city walls. 40 people were bitten and killed. The ferocious pack was lured into the heart of the city, close to Notre Dame Cathedral. There, a mob hell-bent on revenge, stoned and speared the wolves to death. While the wolf and coyote have always posed a threat to humans in parts of North America, there's a much more dangerous animal at large. The powerful cougar, also known as a puma, or mountain lion is thought to have killed at least 18 people since records began. Aniela was almost one of them. While on a mountain bike ride with her friend, a cougar pounced and tried to snap her neck. And you think, this is just a nightmare. I told myself I'd rather die. The rugged canyons of Whiting Ranch Wilderness Park are a big draw for thrill-seeking mountain bikers. But here, taking a tumble is not the only hazard. The park is home to some spectacular and dangerous wildlife, including the feared cougar. California fishing game. Uh, gives a, a range of population from four to 6,000 cougars in California. This 110-pound male cougar works alone. They're very good at being top predators and, uh, and surviving in the landscape. Their quickness, their agility, their smoothness of movement, uh, they're just good at that. The cougar has just taken a fresh kill they will immediately take them off into the, the brush, and that gives them cover and uh, allows them to feed in peace. One cougar will have a, a territory of roughly 30 to 50 or more square miles. The big cat buries what he doesn't eat for another time. He'll attack anything that threatens his food cache. Oh, the slow poke. 
even humans. Aniela, a personal trainer and ex-Marine, and her friend Deb Nichols meet up for a biking excursion. They choose Cactus Hill Trail because of its exciting twists and turns. Anne and I got together because we have common r riding styles. We um, tend to just like to ride hard and not talk a lot. I tend to take up sports where there's usually some rough play. <laughs> You have to be willing to get dirty, have to be willing to, you know, get cuts and scrapes and maybe some poison oak along the way. Um, but I love it for the adventure. But today, Cactus Hill Trail will take them on a journey they won't soon forget. Ann and Debbie are heading straight into a death trap. We were just kind of, you know, coming into the downhill section, you're going to finish the ride soon. All the climbing is done. Um, and our goal was to make it out before it got dark. The cougar jealously guards its precious food. Mountain lions don't move very far uh, from their kills once they've uh, cached the kill, they tend to stay relatively nearby. Just up the trail, another cyclist discovers an abandoned bicycle. Hello. He has no idea who it belongs to. As I was um, first turning down that trail, Cactus Trail, when I came around one of the blind corners, we actually saw a man standing with his bike and then the second bike with no person. And my instinct was that they had stopped and that his friend was going to the bathroom. So honestly, I didn't really take it very seriously. The cougar's heightened sense of hearing picks up the noisy cyclists. They're invading his territory. Debbie falls behind. The distance between them has made both more vulnerable. Thinking his food cache is threatened, the mountain lion moves into attack mode. As I was moving down the trail, what caught my attention was I saw a flash of movement. I saw kind of a reddish brown fur. Initially thought that I had startled a deer and then the impact. The cougar can leap a, a great distance in the realm of 20 to 30 feet and will jump on their back and uh, bite the back of the neck. The only thing I can liken it to would be if you're riding your bike and you got hit by a car from behind. That's what it felt like to me. I mean, the impact was unbelievable. I was face down, and he was trying to bite at the back of my neck. And I knew, OK, this isn't a deer. The lion's impetus is to kill as quickly and as efficiently as possible, because that reduces its own energy expenditure and its own uh, chance of harm. I just couldn't believe that, that had just happened to me. This is just a nightmare. This can't really be happening. You can't wrap your brain around it. Anne's helmet protects her for now. But the cougar is determined to win this battle. If they don't kill with the first bite, they may move uh, their bite gradually around to the, to the front of the throat and uh, uh, take the prey down by asphyxiation. You know, it was like nothing I've ever experienced before in my life. It was so completely overpowering. I could feel it actually hanging on to my shoulders. The uh, lion's claws were dug into each of my shoulders, and he was trying to bite at the back of my neck. He was able to manipulate and move me around, um, release his grip and grab on again, and just drag me. I could hear Anne's cry, screaming, 
um, and it sounded unusual. It sounded like a siren over and over, and then just within an instant, I came around the corner and saw the mountain lion. Debbie needs to think fast. In sheer desperation, she tries to scare the animal away. He didn't even flinch. They're very focused predators. They, they don't get distracted easily. They uh, have to finish what they start. Risking her own life, Debbie does the only thing she can think of. When I grabbed her leg, I thought, you know, it was going to be something that would you know, alarm him at least, but it didn't, it didn't seem to phase him. You know, all it would have taken is one swipe from that lion to take Debbie out. And she put herself in that situation where that was a very strong possibility. And I, you know, had the death grip on the calf I was just amazed at his strength. I just remember watching her face and watching her hanging onto my leg and screaming at the top of her lungs. Debbie's frantic attempts aren't working. She can't pry her friend loose. I was very aware that he just basically ripped my face off. An adult male cougar's powerful jaws are comprised of 30 razor-sharp teeth. Measuring as long as two inches, these massive canines are used to deliver a lethal bite. The other teeth are specialized in slicing and shearing flesh. They're able to crush uh, leg bones, femurs, uh, large bones, and, and commonly eat the entire skull. They're very, very strong. Anne is fighting a highly motivated killer and losing. To be honest, that was the only time. It was for a split second, but I, I basically told myself I'd rather die. I don't remember anything but his tail smacking and his eyes. I'm thinking, I'm so close and I'm screaming so loud. Why don't you let go of you know, her face? A group of cyclists up the trail hear Debbie's screams. They arrive with Anne's life hanging by a thread. I can't hold her much longer. I kept repeating that. I can't hold her much longer. One of the cyclists calls for help as the others join in the fight. But it's almost too late. The animal's large canines sink into Anne's throat. Once he locked down, things started to go black. You know, I started kind of seeing stars. And uh, I knew that that was going to be the end. Anne Yella is now on the edge of death, and her friend is powerless to help. Aniella has been savagely attacked by a cougar in a California national park. Her best friend and two passing cyclists struggle to save her before it's too late. Dear God, please give me the strength to hold on to her. He's eventually gonna let go. But the cougar is determined to finish the job. Their focus is intense, even to the point of ignoring a certain amount of negative stimuli, rocks and sticks and things like that. They're very focused, but they do recognize that they're getting hit, and, uh, and at some point, they potentially will give up. One of the rocks finally hits its mark. The cougar relents and lets go. The attack may be over, but Anne's struggle to survive isn't. She needs medical attention. Urgently. Stay, stay down. Stay down. Come here, short. When I came to, uh, you know, I was lying on my back at that point, and I felt as though I was drowning. And we realized that it was blood. Come on. Debbie is also fearful the cougar may want to finish what he started. Hold her next to him. Immediately thought, I just want to get out of this area. I felt very uneasy that he probably hadn't left, but that, you know, he was 
close by. They don't get rewarded by giving up easily. All of their evolutionary history dictates that once they start, they, uh, they have to stick with it. The paramedics arrive at the scene. They fear she may not make it to the hospital in time. My neck hurt so bad. Um, just every muscle was just torn. That's what it felt like. You know, it was so painful to even try to lift my head an inch. And I just said to her, Ann, you're going to be, you're going to make it. You're going to be fine. It's going to be OK. The cougar stays in the area, still protecting his food cache while Anne is airlifted to the hospital. Surgeons tell Anne that the cougar's bites were millimeters away from ending her life. My plastic surgeon told me he found 40 bite wounds to my neck alone, and then I had, obviously, severe wounds to my face. It wasn't gonna be a quick fix. This is not like one surgery, I'm back to normal. And then I realized I'm not ever gonna be back to normal. Later that evening, park rangers locate the owner of the abandoned bicycle. He had been making his way down Cactus Hill Trail when his chain came off. Unaware, he was being watched. The animal struck with deadly force. The cougar likely snapped his victim's spinal cord in one bite. Gosh, just I can't believe that I'm still here. It kind of helped me to be so thankful that I was still alive, to realize that here this adult man had been killed, and I made it. A team of park rangers has no choice but to track the man-eater. He shot dead not 50 yards from his first kill. Unwilling until death to give it up. I think they're gorgeous animals. I have a lot of respect for what they're capable of, appreciating that they need their space too. An experience like this obviously makes you appreciate your friends, Debbie specifically. She risked her own life. That's true friendship. Their domestic cousins may be household pets, but in the wild, Hunger or disease can occasionally drive these animals to target human prey. When Australian Eric Neeras went diving for shellfish in 2007, he was nearly bitten in two by a great white shark. Everything went black. I started to get shaken horizontally. I was getting eaten alive. The great white shark is top of the food chain. Hardly changed since the dinosaurs, it's the ultimate killing machine. This full-grown shark is now targeting Cape Howe on the south coast of Australia. The strong currents here attract fish, which attract seals, which are the shark's favorite food. It's the rich marine life at Cape Howe that also attracts fishermen to these waters. Eric Neeras is one of them. He specializes in abalone, a large sea mollusk and culinary delicacy. I call myself an underwater laborer. <laughs> Basically, we crawl around the bottom of the ocean measuring abalone and collecting them. It's a pretty strenuous job. If I don't catch a certain amount of abalone each month, I don't make any money, so I can't pay my bills. To tell you the truth, that day, I was only half-heartedly getting ready to go to work. Being school holidays, I could have found something more interesting to do, like take the kids out to a park or the movies and have a family day out. Today, 
Eric's 16-year-old son, Mark, is joining him. He's working as a deckhand. Mark was only out with me to make a bit of pocket money for himself. He'd only deckied for me about four times. So he wasn't actually what you'd call experienced at all. Mark isn't as comfortable as his father in these waters. Every time we've been out before, like, we've seen sharks, and there'll be sharks, like, just fly in front of our boat. I don't know, it was just a morning, like, it was real freaky morning, like, real quiet and, like, no noise or nothing like that. Sort of think to yourself, something's going to go bad, something's going to go bad. Mark's intuition is dead on. A hungry great white has returned to these familiar waters where it hunts its favorite prey, seals. In the water, Eric breathes through a long hose that feeds him oxygen from onboard tanks. He also wears special clothing. I wore a lead blonde weight vest. It has about seven millimeter thick lead plate sewed inside it. And it fully covers your back and most of your chest. And um, that keeps you on the bottoms. Although shark attacks are extremely rare, Eric knows it's a hazard that goes with the job. When you're a diver and you're in, you know, their domain, you've always got that inkling in the back of your mind. Um, I wonder if a shark will show up. The water was actually dirtier than I would normally would like to dive in. That's when you start to even imagine that there's something out there and the hair on the back of your neck will stand up. And... A seal or a school of large fish go past you and all of a sudden you'll start to think, OK, I wonder if there's something chasing them. Surprise is the great white's best tactic. Stealthily, the hungry animal closes in on its next meal. Seals are very cognizant of sharks being in an area, and it's not unusual to see them haul out under those circumstances. Unlike the seals, Eric hasn't yet picked up on the shark. I sort of wound my way around the boulders and the kelp and just sort of hugged the bottom, and after an hour, I filled up my first bag, and I sent that bag up to Mark. I remember looking up at Mark at the hull of the boat, I could just see it, and I thought, beauty, Mark's doing his job, he's right above my air bubbles, he's a good kid, he's following me, he's not too far away. Mark's not sure why, but he can't shake the feeling that something's not quite right. It was just weird, like, and I kept going over the side of the boat and looking down and didn't feel right, didn't at all. getting into cruise mode. You know, you sort of get into a daydream mode where you just work and forget about everything else. It's so peaceful too, you can only hear the hum of your air regulator. wetsuit are doing a pretty darn good job of making themselves look like a seal or a sea lion. second it was daylight, the next second everything went black and a really 
nasty vice-like pressure crushing my chest and upper back. And I wasn't really sure what had actually happened to me. The shark has taken one supersized bite. Eric's head and shoulders are in its mouth. One arm is down its throat. Inside the jaws, I couldn't see any light. It was just all dark there because I was facing the back of his throat. My right arm was actually hanging down the shark's throat. My arm refused to work anymore. It felt like it was broken. The head in a seal is the working end of a, of a critter, and sharks know that much. If they can bite off the head, the rest of it's an easy meal. I've never experienced anything like this in my whole life. Eric's lead vest has stopped the shark's razor-sharp teeth from slicing him in two. But this only makes the animal more determined. Then I started to get shaken horizontally with a really hard threshing motion. When a shark head shakes, what it's doing is dragging its teeth, especially its upper teeth, through the prey from side to side like this and sawing through the prey. By thinking, oh, is this the end? Is this what it's like to die? I was actually getting eaten alive. A great white shark has half swallowed abalone fisherman Eric Neeras. All that's saving him from certain death is his lead diving vest. My instinct kicked in and I had a free left hand, and I started to feel around the jawline of the shark, and I reached up higher, and I felt a slimy membrane. I realized that must have been the eye. Eric gouges his fingers deep into the shark's eye. Anything we can do that demonstrates to the shark that we're big and strong and are willing to fight back is a good thing. Surprised by the counterattack, the shark begins to loosen its hold. And I started to wriggle out backwards a bit, and I wasn't sure if I was going to get out or not. And just as I thought I was going to be free, the bottom jaw closed, and I felt these teeth going into the back of my head, into my skull. I twisted as hard as I could again, trying to gouge the eye, and the shark reacted again. The animal at that point reacted by letting go as a matter of defense for its own self. Uh, sharks aren't dummies. Eric caused it pain. It realized that it had a formidable uh, foe there in the water. The shark was looking at me like face to face. Um, it's the scariest sight I've ever seen. As Eric's blood seeps into the water, the shark waits for its prey to weaken even further. The white shark will bite and let go its prey to cause exsanguination, leaves it to bleed to death till it gets weaker, and then it comes in to finish it off. You really think your time's up. You think, OK, it's, it's got me. It, it can fly into me and finish me whenever it likes. When uh, you're in a situation where you feel you're going to lose your life, you get a uh, few thoughts that flash through your mind. And uh, I thought about Mark. He'd never see me again. And I knew the mental effect that would have on a 16-year-old. Sort of tried to calm myself down. And I thought, well, if I panic, um, I'm only going to be dead anyway. Eric is faced with a life or death decision swim to the surface or try and hide from the shark somewhere on the sea floor. The water was going a dirty brown color around me from blood loss. Blood attracts sharks and that's when I made the decision that I was going to go to the surface. And as the shark slowly circled me, I spread my legs and, and arms out a bit so it could see that I wasn't a seal. I was something, you know, different to what it normally would eat. Eric heads for the surface. It's a gamble that could cost him his life. If the animal reacts to the sudden movement, Eric's finished. Searching for abalone on the sea floor, Australian Eric Neeras has been half swallowed by a great white shark. He's managed to fight free, and now he needs to get out of the water before it strikes again. 
those marble dolls with the black painted eyes, that glossy black colour. That's the colour of those sharks' eyes, just a dead, dead black. And when you've got those eyes on you, and they're only like one to two metres away, it makes you feel very small indeed. It really had a, a tough job holding back the fear. Eric breaks the surface, but the 15-foot monster is still circling below. The whole time the shark was just below me, going around and around my flippers, and it could have, you know, uh, taken me any time it wanted to. The shark didn't want to just rush right back in because the last time it did that, it didn't have a pleasant outcome. Dad! I'm coming! All Eric wants is to get out of the water fast. I screamed at Mark that I needed help. He came straight over to me. Eric makes it out alive, but his wounds are horrific. I suffered a broken arm, a broken nose. Four teeth went into the back of my skull, and my other teeth marks are in my chest. So thank God for that lead vest, or I wouldn't be here now. Eric tried to return to abalone fishing, but fear kept him out of the water. Now he works on dry land as a security officer. I can't even say how much it hurt still to this day like the knowing that I could have lost the best thing in my life and like I just don't know how to say it like there's no words that can literally say it when you've had a narrow escape and you sort of feel you've been given a second chance um, it makes a great deal of difference to your life and all of a sudden you start to appreciate things that you didn't even think about before we're pretty good mates young Mark and myself. Ever since people first ventured into the seas, we have been afraid of the monsters that lurk below. The great white shark has always been the most feared, infamous as a ruthless predator that will kill anything. But the smaller bull shark is actually fiercer packed with more testosterone than any other creature on the planet. These naturally bad-tempered sharks can attack their prey in as little as two feet of water. When a bull shark bites, almost nothing will make it let go. In the summer of 1916, a horrifying series of shark attacks shocked holidaymakers in New Jersey. Originally blamed on the Great White, these attacks were in part the inspiration for the novel Jaws. But many experts now think the villains were really bull sharks. The first victim that summer of 1916 was Charles Epting Vansant. He started shouting for help, but people assumed he was calling to a nearby dog. When a lifeguard finally reached him, his left thigh was stripped of flesh. Van Sant bled to death before reaching the hospital. The Coast Guard was sure this was a freak accident, so beaches remained open. A fatal decision. Just five days later, a second killing. The ocean turned red when a hungry shark went for Charles Bruder. It bit his right leg clean off. Bruder bled to death before he could be rescued. The next attacks were even more terrifying. The scene of the crimes, 16 miles inland in a freshwater creek. 12-year-old Lester Stilwell was playing in the water with friends. They noticed what they thought was an old log in the water. It started swimming towards them. Suddenly, the shark pulled Lester under and he never surfaced. A man entered the water to bravely search for the boy's body, but he too was fatally wounded by the bloodthirsty shark. 
Experts now know that great whites can't survive in fresh water, but bull sharks can. Bull sharks may actually be responsible for many more attacks than previously thought. Chuck Anderson knows just how aggressive a bull shark can be. When training for a triathlon in 2000, he was savagely attacked by a bull shark, an attack that changed Chuck's life forever. He's just freight train. And even though I hadn't seen it, I knew exactly what it was. The Gulf of Mexico is famous for crystal blue waters and white sandy beaches. But this is America's shark attack capital. In fact, there are more shark attacks here than anywhere else in the world. Almost anyone that's uh, been in the water uh, have been close to a shark at some time. The sharks see the humans. Uh, humans don't always see the shark. And public enemy number one is the ferocious bull shark. It will target almost anything that moves, even humans. Bull sharks mean business. Uh, when they attack, they truly are going after a human. And what they start, they mean to finish. Bull sharks are persistent, and I think for that reason, I would be a lot more concerned about a bull shark than, than a white shark. It's early morning, and this bull shark is already on the hunt. It patrols the shoreline because it knows sooner or later something tasty will swim by. Chuck Anderson, a former football coach and father of two, is training for a triathlon. Today, he intends to train in the ocean. He is joined by a friend, Richard Watley, and four-time Hawaiian Ironman champion, Karen Forfer. I was very honored to be swimming with Karen that day. She was such a good swimmer. And the male ego of keeping up with a 64-year-old lady kind of kicked in automatically. The swimmers know there are sharks in these waters, but they're prepared to risk it for the love of their sport. I always was a little bit leery when I got out there. I was constantly looking around and that sort of thing, but still in the back of your mind, it was kind of always there. And, and I remember thinking, you know, I, you know, gosh, I was a little bit nervous out there that day. Picking up on the erratic movement in the water, the bull shark moves in closer to investigate. Humans are not a natural part of the sea. As a result, we as humans are engaging in provocative acts simply because we splash so much, we make so much noise, we do so many other things that are attractive to sharks. Chuck's friend swims alone in a deeper water where there is less of an undertow. Karen and Chuck, however, feel safer sticking together closer to the shoreline. A decision they will soon regret. After five minutes, Chuck finally gets into a groove. His mind is now focused on outswimming Karen. Then we got to a, a place that I knew were an old set of piling. Pier is built there and it blown down during uh, Hurricane Frederick back in the late 70s. That's essentially an artificial reef. First, various invertebrates grow on the piling, then fish come to eat those invertebrates, then bigger fish come to eat those, and then sharks come to eat those. And so it's a natural area where, as a shark, one would go to find food. Unwittingly, the swimmers have now entered this shark's natural killing ground. Karen kind of went ahead of me. I'd like to say I was chivalrous and letting her go through the pilings, but actually she was kicking my rear end pretty good. The shark observes his potential meal as the swimmers make their way past the pilings. I remember looking at my watch and it was 6.38 a.m. I took two more strokes in the water. Nailed. Uh, 
felt like a linebacker getting run over by a fullback. He just freight trained me. He hit me and knocked me out of the water. A classic bump and bite attack. The shark was getting a feel for uh, the size and the power of whatever it was going to bite. And even though I hadn't seen it, I knew exactly what it was. I felt like he knew that I was out there in his territory, and he wasn't very happy about it. My big fear was that there was more than one. There was a school of sharks, and that I was in real trouble. I started hollering for Karen, who had gotten a pretty good ways away from me at that stage of the game, to get to the beach, get to the beach now, hurry, get to the beach. Karen races to shore. But Chuck is too far out. He's on his own. Well, it's, a, it's a pretty helpless feeling. You know, there was no way I was going to outswim anything that was out there with me. Chuck desperately searches for any sign of the shark. And I was treading water, and I remember looking around on the surface. What Chuck can't see is that the shark is gunning straight for him. I've been a scuba diver before, and when you're down on the bottom, you can see around you. Uh, that part of it you can kind of come to grips with and handle because you see what's happening around you. When you're on the surface of the water, I, I didn't know what I was dealing with. I didn't know where it was coming from. I didn't know when it was going to get to me. I put my face in the water. When I did, up from the bottom was, was the shark coming directly at me. Chuck begins to panic. He knows the shark could finish him off with one vicious bite. Chuck Anderson is training for a triathlon when he's ambushed by a hungry bull shark. The animal only bumped him the first time, but now it's going in for the kill. I realized that if I didn't get a hold of myself, that if I panicked, that I was going to be in a lot more trouble than if I tried to have a plan and protect myself. And just instinctively, I threw my hands out to push off of him. Chuck's move is disastrous. I took all four fingers off my right hand, just clean as a whistle. White knuckles were showing through. I mean, they were literally exposed. The bull shark is probably one of the most powerful biters. Its head is extremely big and robust. It has huge muscles, jaw muscles. It's a very strong predator in terms of its jaw morphology. Undoubtedly, the shark just missed. I'm sure the shark would have much rather had um, the entire lower arm if it could have grabbed it. The taste of flesh sends the animal's killer instincts into overdrive. This time, he's determined to get a bigger bite. I thought, he's not going to just swim off. There's blood here. He's taking a bite of me. He's going to keep coming back. I realized I'm not going to survive. Fighting a 300-pound shark in open water is a losing battle. A big fear that I had was that he would attack me from the back. You know, I couldn't protect myself if he came from the back, and I couldn't see him. That's when he hit me. And I remember kind of losing a little bit of my breath. He hit me that hard. Bull sharks will hit the victim over and over again. And they'll actually single them out amongst a bunch of people. If there's mul multiple people in the water, sometimes they'll go through the people and hit the same victim over and over again. Chuck doesn't have time to react because the shark's fin is once again slicing through the water towards him. Everything goes in slow motion. You're kind of in a fog. I think it won't ever end. It's just a strange, eerie type of feeling. My kids kept coming to mind, and I just couldn't imagine ending my life without being able to tell them I love them. I remember thinking if I was going to survive, I had to get mad. The shark opens its massive jaws and drags its prey into the deep. As I pushed off of him, he actually latched his mouth onto my right arm. 
and took me immediately down to the bottom, 12, 15 feet of water. He started doing the gnashing, the feeding frenzy, just threw me around on the bottom of the guff like I was a rag doll. The shark's only mission is to eat. He tries to chew off Chuck's arm. If there's one species that one could say that actually goes into a feeding frenzy, I would say it's a bull shark. Uh, once they get into the attack mode, you can't change their mind. I'm a pretty big guy. It was ridiculous how easy he was throwing me around. I never thought I'd get back up to the surface. The testosterone-crazed bull shark hasn't finished with Chuck. And now, the athlete is on the verge of drowning. A bull shark has viciously attacked triathlete Chuck Anderson. The animal has been thrashing its human prey for over a minute. It was at that stage of the game that me and the good Lord had a conversation, and I asked him to get me up to the surface so I could get a breath of fresh air. And all of a sudden, I felt my heels dragging on sand. Now the shark's dragging him at high speed towards the beach. In its determination to eat Chuck, incredibly, the shark drags him onto a sandbar. The swimmer seizes his only chance of survival. He couldn't move. I had my arm in his mouth. I was trying to hold my face away from his mouth so that he wouldn't snap at my face. And it was a real unique feeling as I was hitting him, and I kicked him a couple of times, and uh, I was doing everything I could to get away from him, but it wasn't, wasn't phasing the shark at all. I mean, I know people say poke him in the eye, but when you're dead in front of a shark and the eyes are on the side, you know, I couldn't see his eyes, and being on the surface, that type of thing, I didn't have time to collect my thoughts to, OK, let's poke him in the eye. Or it, it, most of it's instinctive, and my instinct was to hit him and, and kick him and that sort of thing, trying to get away. I couldn't get my arm out of his mouth by pulling, so I worked it up and down twice and jerked real hard. And when I did, it completely degloving my arm. A hand popped off in his mouth. There really wasn't a sense of, oh my gosh, I've lost an arm. It was more of a sense of, oh my gosh, I survived. You know, I'm very fortunate I should be dead. The shark has lost the battle. It waits for the next wave and propels itself out to sea. Couldn't get a helicopter in uh, to, to pick me up and take me to an, uh, a trauma unit. And so I remember one, one paramedic turned to the other and said, man, if we don't get him to the hospital in the next few minutes, he's going to die. And I thought, whoa, time out. Hang on. That's not an option here. Now, I thought I was fine. And the guy said, Coach, you're, you're blue. You're losing blood. We can't stop the bleeding. If we don't hurry up and get you to a hospital, you're in real trouble. And I thought that that was the first time that I really had time to think about the fact that I might die. And that was a real scary moment. Chuck is rushed to the hospital, where what remains of his arm is amputated at the elbow. I was halfway to the hospital before I ever really came to grips with the fact that, hey, you don't have a right arm anymore. And I promise you, it's not going to come back. Despite the tragedy, Chuck Anderson is determined not to let it ruin his life. Just 10 months after the attack, the father of two competes in an able body triathlon and wins. My kids were on either side of me, and we crossed the finish line together. And, uh, geez. And I was proud as his dad that I could show my kids, if you work hard enough, you know, you can do whatever you want to do. The bull shark may be the most aggressive shark in coastal waters, but in the deep, the oceanic white tip is the greater menace. About three quarters the size of a great white, this shark rarely encounters people. But when a ship goes down or a plane crash lands on water, the deadly white tip will target human prey. In fact, the white tip is responsible for the largest ever attack on people.
just after midnight on July 30th, 1945. The Japanese torpedoed the USS Indianapolis. The battleship had delivered the first atomic bomb and was on a new mission in the West Pacific when it was hit. Of the nearly 1,200 sailors aboard, 900 are thought to have made it into the water alive. Sharks were most likely drawn to the wreckage by the sound of screaming, splashing men. The white tips went into a feeding frenzy. The men's horrific ordeal lasted five long days. By the time rescue boats arrived, more than 500 sailors were missing. Many had been devoured by the hungry sharks. Although the bull shark and the oceanic white tip may be more aggressive, it's the great white that has entered popular folklore as the ultimate ocean-going serial killer. Its size and power mean it will always be seen as the most terrifying of all sea creatures. In 1830, Joseph Blaney was attacked by a great white while he was fishing off the coast of Boston. The shark capsized Blaney's boat and pulled it right under, with the fishermen still in it. The boat resurfaced, but Blaney was never seen again. 130 years later, during a spear fishing competition, Australian Rodney Fox was attacked by a great white. It's one of the worst shark attacks anyone has ever survived. I was held through the water faster than I could swim. Right at the edge of my life, I was in really big trouble. <laughs> This great white shark is swimming the waters of South Australia, looking for food. He's around 20 feet long and 4,000 pounds. He is constantly on the hunt. And as Rodney Fox knows, it will eat almost anything that moves. December the 8th, 1963, at uh, one o'clock in the afternoon, is a time I will never, never forget. Changed things in my whole life forever. Today, it's Rodney's chance to retain his crown as South Australian spear fishing champion. He's been training hard and determined to win despite the choppy water. The weather wasn't very nice. It was a little bit windy, but it, it was something I had worked for. I had done so many deep diving and exercises and much practice holding my breath, and I'd made two beautiful spear guns. Rodney is aware of the risks. 18 months earlier in this bay, his friend was attacked by a shark, which bit deep into his leg. The word shark was sort of out there in the, in the background with the hell and death and devil and that, things like that. I was well aware that I could actually be attacked, but of course I didn't believe that it would be me. The winner today will be the person who catches the largest number of different species in a five-hour period. The gun went off and everybody raced towards the, the shore. And I knew that um, I had to work hard and you didn't get the fish on the surface. You had to be down there with them. You had to approach them in such a way where they didn't think you were an aggressive attacker. And then you would slowly bring the gun around and sneak up on them. Rodney isn't reckless. He takes precautions against a shark attack. What you do is to, to attach the fish onto a float that uh, you tow with you on about 10 metres of uh, ski rope. If any sharks came along looking for the bleeding fish, they can take them without getting near you. This great white shark may be miles from Aldinga Beach, 
but its powerful sense of smell soon picks up on the blood in the water. It stealthily makes its way towards Rodney's tempting catch. Because of their injuries, any speared fish is going to be releasing bodily fluids, um, blood and other things into the water. A shark, can, for instance, can smell a single drop of blood in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. That's pretty darn good. Blood from the fish that had been speared was slowly going out to sea. In the tide, it was putting an odor trail several kilometers down the coast. The blood, the struggling fish in the water, any electrical charge it picks up or anything like that, the shark would be attracted to that and probably swim upstream to find it. I was so focused on doing well and looking for fish that I couldn't really think about anything else that might happen. I got uh, a fairly large boar fish, which was really a prize fish and gave high points. And I thought, it could be a lucky day today. After almost four hours in the water, Rodney comes in to weigh his fish and assess his chance of winning. I found out that there was one fish that I really needed that would build up my points. And I cast my eyes over the area and thought, where would I find this particular species? And I thought, well, well out past the reef in very deep water. Rodney heads back into the ocean, past the reef. But venturing off on his own puts him on a deadly collision course with a natural born killer. There's safety in numbers. Um, that's why birds are found in flocks and fish are found in schools. Spear fishermen should be found in groups. Once you isolate yourself uh, from the rest of the group, you become more vulnerable. Alone and out on the edge of the reef, Rodney has no idea he's swimming directly towards the shark. A shark that has Rodney in its sights. Humans aren't denizens of the sea. Um, we don't see very well in the water. We don't smell things. We don't feel the vibrations of, of animals moving. And so we're not attuned to watching over our shoulder for predators. Rodney tracks down his elusive prey. All he needs to do now is spear the prized fish, and the competition is his. I was just squeezing the trigger when... The shark's massive jaws clamp around Rodney's chest. It begins thrashing him violently. White sharks often engage in the marine version of shock and awe. Nothing is better as a predator than to have a sudden strike of overpowering strength to put your prey item in trouble. The gun was knocked off my hand. The mask was knocked off my face. And I was actually hurled through the water faster than I could swim. I don't know why, but I thought, oh, I've been hit by a train. And even though I knew I was going fast, I have this memory of the shark's tail slowly going through the water. As the shark drags Rodney deeper and deeper, it uses its razor-sharp teeth to try and sever his body in half. The great white shark has uh, broadly triangular teeth that work just like a steak knife, but in tandem, it's like having a big saw. The fear of dying overcomes the fear of normal pain. The adrenaline that it braces into your body gives you special powers to be able to think and do. And as I was being forced through the water, it said, gouge his eyes, gouge his eyes. Rodney reaches around the two-ton beast and digs his fingers into one of its eyes. Miraculously, the animal lets go. No! No! 
but it has no intention of giving up on a spear fisherman. The gouge of the eyes or the gills of a shark, and that is probably not what the shark would expect. So the texture, the taste, the response, everything is not what they expected. The animal abandons the attack at that point, not quite sure what it is. Doesn't mean they won't come back. The fear was unbelievable, it was right at the edge of my life. I was in really big trouble. I knew I may not make it, but it never occurred to me to give up. Just keep fighting. Rodney looks down into the deep. And a picture that stays with me now is of this bright red water, which is my blood, and this great big head coming up from down below with those big triangular teeth towards me. And I thought, what can I do, what can I do? I have nothing to protect myself. I'm gone, I'm gone. The shark turned, instead of going for me, swallowed the whole fish float with the fish. It looks like Rodney's cheated death. But then, a violent jolt. He's still attached to the float, and the shark dives and pulls him under. I put my hand on my stomach, trying to find the catch, but it must have swung all the way around. I couldn't find it. Rodney is quickly running out of oxygen. He can't hold his breath any longer. Those were the last few seconds that I was going to have of my whole life. In Australia, spearfishing champion Rodney Fox has been savaged by a great white shark. He survived the first onslaught, but the shark has swallowed Rodney's fish float, and the float is still attached to Rodney. As I was being dragged down, down, down into the water, I'm running out of air, and I thought, I'm gone, I'm gone. I can't hold on any longer. I'm going to have to breathe water and drown. With no hope, Rodney gives up the fight. The shark has won. Then the line snaps. Instantly, I thought I have more chance. I've got life. I can make it to the surface. Rodney has to get out of the water before the shark returns for more. Unbelievably, a boat was coming over to find out what all the bright red water was. Rodney has only just escaped with his life, but his injuries are horrific. The lung was punctured, the spleen was uncovered, the main artery from the heart to the stomach was just left there, one nick, and I've died. Rodney has cheated death, but before long, the champion spear fisherman returns to the water. Sharks came at all angles from me. The little glistenings of the water turned into sharks. And I remember saying to myself, if you don't control this right now, you're going to be no good. And I had to shake my head and get rid of the sharks and turn it back into little glistening things again. I wasn't meant to go. But you can't get much closer to death than that. There are over 375 species of sharks swimming the world's oceans. But despite their fearsome reputation, only four target humans. Shark attacks are very rare. Fatalities, more so. But when a killer shark has us in its sights, it's the shark that rules the ocean.